escaped. Mm. Turning them on. When the red light is on, that mm-hmm. makes your mind. We'll go ahead and get started since we do have a long day. Um, I'd like to, before we even begin the meeting, thank our staff um, for the tour yesterday. Steve Rumrell, um, Chris Kern, the district staff. We also had um, some great presentations and help from people in the area. The the tours turn out to be quite a highlight for us for these for the getting ready for these meetings for getting a perspective this time both Sea Rise and a pretty remarkable collaboration among the agency people the the Tillamook Estuary Program um, the county and several others and just seeing directly on the ground what Sea Rise could or may look like. Um, So thank you to staff. It was great to have that tour. Just to start this morning, I'm Mary Wall, chair of the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission, and I'd like to call the April 19th, 2024 meeting to order. Um, And we'll do start with introductions. So vice chair. Good morning, Becky Hatfield-Hyde. And I would also like to just extend what a great tour we had yesterday really neat to be here in Tillamook seeing all of the good work that's being done by staff and partners beautiful morning it is uh, Bob Spellbrink Slides Oregon good morning can you guys hear me okay do I need this closer excuse me good morning Dr. Leslie King from Portland and it is great to be here on the coast and it's a fine navy day here in the officers mass great to see all of you Hi, I'm Dr. Kathy and Khalil, also from Portland, Oregon. And yes, had a beautiful drive in through the Tillamook State Forest today. So already feeling the sense of place. <laughs> Great. Um, we also have Commissioner Labhart online. So Commissioner Labhart. Commissioner Labhart, can you hear us and check in? We'll let him introduce himself in a minute, but just know that we have one other commissioner who is online. And with that, maybe we could go to the director's report. Actually, let me just back myself up. Director Palmari, will you introduce yourself? And then we'll have Michelle introduce herself and do the logistics too. Thank you, Chairwall. Good morning, everybody. I'm Interim Director Davia Palmieri. 
and uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention that we already missed Director Melcher, but um, <laughs> I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Michelle. Good morning. My name is Michelle Tate. I'm here today to provide support to the commission and the directors so that we can hold this meeting in a hybrid model. Um, I do want to um, thank the Port of Port of Tillamook for hosting us here at this lovely venue and um, how much we've enjoyed Tillamook this last few days. I also want to um, to let you know that we have replaced our our system, our sound system that had been stolen, and I um, would like to explain a few things that have changed in this system. The biggest change is the microphone style that we have. This these microphones are we're now up to date with what the new technology is. So these are they pick up very well, and they pick up yesterday from all over the room. So it's best if you keep your mic muted. I do not have the capability to mic mute individually. I can only mute the entire system. So when you want to talk, you want to push the, the bar that's at the bottom of here. When the red light turns on, that means that your mic is live. So um, there's a maximum of four microphones that can be turned on. So if, you're not, if your microphone is not turning on, then, then that's because we have too many already live. And that's all I've got. Thank you. And I would like to mention that after the director's report and after temporary rules, we will get an update on the director recruitment. So we'll talk about that briefly as well. So go ahead. Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, so for today, you have your field reports uh, in written form. And so let me know if you have any questions. And if not, we'll call up Deputy Director Shannon Hearn for the financial report. Mana. Oh, good morning. <laughs> um, happy to go first, not only to test out the mic, but I also get to recognize for the first time Director Palmieri. So that's very exciting. Thanks for having me today. Um, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, members of the Commission, Shannon Hearn, Deputy Director for Administration. In your packet, you will see that you have, once again, um, the Director's Financial Report. Um, we've narrowed it down. There's no update on um, the ODF and W audit. Um, I did talk to our auditor. There was really, we're just in an interim between wrapping things up and then starting with the June um, look for what her work will be over the next year. So I use the space to talk about the 25-27 budget. Um, but before we get into that, I did highlight for you what we have in state treasury. Um, our unrestricted cash balance finished at 55.4 million and restricted cash came in at 62.5 for a total ending balance of 119.9 million. And I'll just say, because we're digging into budgets, remember, the non-dedicated portion of that is our operating reserve. So ending balance is not our operating reserves. It's just total what we have in treasury between dedicated and non-dedicated funding. Moving into the 25-27 budget, the real update is we did hold on April 4th our first public engagement meeting, which means we need to have a lot of materials ready to go um, to start daylighting what we're planning for 25-27. It was a great meeting, uh, went the entire two hours, the last half hour was some good questions. We did record it, so it's online for anyone to go back and reference. Um, we had about 85 slides that we went through. We really focused on the 23-25 budget and success because that, of course, is our base program budget when we start building 25-27. And we've had a lot of success really recently with partners of getting general fund and other fund other than license, but other funds as a funding stream category, um, getting more money into our budgets. And we showed a growth chart in that presentation, which I believe you have as well. Then we moved into 2527, knowing most people wanted to hear mainly the directions that we've been given from the governor's office. You guys have all asked me several times, you know, what are you hearing? What's this new process mean? So we dug into that a bit. And then we highlighted where we're at with making um, investments in the 2527 budget. And we acknowledged at that point, we are very much in the draft phase, which feels very weird in April yeah. um, to still be in a draft phase for investment. So most of the time was spent with our division administrators going over, acknowledging what they put as policy option packages for investments. 
before I get into that, it's not in your report, but just last week we've gotten clearer direction. Um, for general fund ask, we will be given between one and 2% of our current service level general fund amount. So that is around a, a million dollars. This actually comes in less than a million dollars. So you now have the policy option list in front of you. You can see what narrow keyhole that is and the decisions we have to make about those general funds and what's a priority. So I just want to emphasize again, it is extremely critical that we hear from our public about what is really important to them or not. Um, our division administrators highlighted a lot of those policy option packages are built on the understanding of either asks we've made before or things we know our partners are interested in. But we're all trying to get on the same page with this agency request budget about what is a priority when that line is about a million dollars in investments. And again, the directions we've gotten from the governor's office is do not build new program. You need to really look at where you've made investments in the past. That should be where you're prioritizing your efforts, especially with that little amount of money. Um, those directions came with a caveat that um, capital construction is not included in that. So we have a hatchery resilience um, pop in there that would use general fund bonding and it has debt service amount in there. We also have, again, a deferred maintenance ask that those don't fall into that limited amount of general fund. Um, also on there are other fund types. So federal fund, if we've got it, we've got to ask for limitation to expend it. Um, and then license revenue. And that was the other big part of the conversation with the public is that we are daylighting where we're going to be at with operating reserves in 2527 and it is time to have a conversation about a fee adjustment and a fee adjustment yeah. bill run during 2025. So we talked about uh, reviewing this in 2021 and reviewing this in 2023 and deciding we didn't need a fee adjustment after the last six-year incremental one but we are in a place now not in dire straits, but it's time to have that conversation on what the impact is to our budgets if we reduce license revenue from hunting and angling sales. Um, we're not really reduce, reducing. We we highlighted a lot of the change here is this pers personnel growth costs, healthcare, those kind of things that everyone's very aware of that just trends up over time. We also highlighted for the public um, our growth in positions on license fund, and we have not been growing positions. 2020, when we got that last fee increase, there was some positions that came in on the hatchery side, but for the main, most part, we, we try very much to contain costs there because we know the next time we revisit it, that's going to be a big ask and a big price point consideration for our customers. So with that, that's the overview of where we're at now. The next steps really are um, to look at our pop list and refine it. Um, what from a business need meets the directions we've gotten from the governor's office. We're, we're again, not really removing anything. We've been told we can't ask for more, but we're really refining these asks as we're working on the reduction exercise to see where we have vacancies and other things that we may be able to self fund some of these asks again, long, long road here, short amount of time. Um, and then we we will be prepared May 16th for that public engagement meeting to, again, have all these materials ready to go with that reduction exercise, where we're at with these pop asks and what is coming forward as a priority, what we've heard from the public as their priorities, and we'll share that at the meeting. And then we plan to package that all up for you and bring it June 14th. And that concludes my financial report. Happy to answer questions. Questions immediately. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. Could you just, for clarity, look at the first two POPs, which would be the um, private forest accord and fish biologists for habitat phase two, in light of what you said about the one to two percent ask limit. So could you just let us know what it would mean for those first two, just as an example, so as we look through these later, we can really know what we're looking at. Thank you, Chair Wall. And if you'll indulge me for a second, maybe folks that aren't familiar with seeing these tables, I'll, I'll let them know um, what they're seeing here. So on the far left, you have where we have essentially bucketized these asks with the yeah. directions from the governor's office. So we're really looking at um, the growing complexity in fish and wildlife management, both on agency resiliency and then species re resiliency for climate change. So kind of laid that out on the far left. That's new. You don't usually see that in these tables. And then we've lifted the number and it gets really nice when we can number these and start referencing them that way. But as soon as we do that, people think that's a priority list. So there is no numbers yet. We, we, we will have that at some point for folks. Um, 
then you get into a brief dis description by title of what we're asking for, um, what division they would go into, and then the package type, whether this is a new pop or a continuation of a pop we've asked for and gotten um, into our budget. And then where the funding source is, what type of funding it is, um, what we estimate roughly now. And again, by April, we usually have a better estimate of these. These are very much rough numbers. Um, and then, again, we lay that out if there's a split in the fund type, how much from each source. And then I want to pull in the number of positions and whether they're permanent or whether they're limited dur duration. So remember, FTE is a full-time equivalent to one position, but a lot of times when we ask for seasonals, you're you're taking three or four seasonals that are only there for three to six months and bunching them together. And it might be one FTE, it might be 0.85, it might be two for eight. It's it's a combination of that. So um, what we're thinking right now to your question, Chair Wall, is that we will um, take the feedback in from the public and we have a online questionnaire right now that asks two questions. One, what do you see in your pops in the pop list that you like? And then what do you think about a fee adjustment in 2025 versus 2027? Um, and then we'll go back and look at our business case around where we can fund these and which ones need to drop off um, because we can't. And then at some point we will tick this list out to prioritize what makes it above that 1%, 2% line. And then what additional asks that we need to make the governors aware of that are um, still critical to our partners. Because if you remember at one point I said, um, they want us to work with our stakeholders and our commissions and boards to kind of prioritize these asks. Um, but they want to have the conversation ongoing about things coming in and coming out from the list. So we just kind of want to re, I don't know, pre-prioritize the list for them around these asks and then keep having conversations as we're hearing from our commission and our stakeholders about what that is. Um, I I don't think 20, 20 million fits very well into the one 2%, but this is a negotiated agreement. So it will be high up on the list, but as it doesn't fit in that amount, we don't want to be in a place where we're asked to self fund that. So go find $20 million in our agency already and then bring it back to the table. So the, this is a big conversation to have around that one in particular. Um, it's, it is an agency request, but it's an agency request for our partners. Um, Oregon Department of Forestry is in the same place with a few of these being kind of question marks of this is agreed through the legislature. So where do we put it on our pop list and where are we required to find funding for it? Yeah. Thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, I was just going to say something about Shannon. Uh, you, we all know she's Deputy Director for Administration, but as I was doing some fish stuff this last work uh, with both staff and uh, and uh, folks that are in the recreational and stuff, I was reminded several times about what a great biologist she is. So <laughs> she's good on both sides. Well, thank you. No, no, I was going to say no question. I was just saying that our former Tillamook County Commissioner has joined us, the former Tillamook State Forester. Can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me okay? Yes. You can hear me? Okay, good. Um, well, first of all, uh, Mark Lampart from Sisters. Um, I apologize that I couldn't make the tour yesterday. I understand it was both uh, very informative and educational. So sorry I couldn't be in my, my home area to join you on the tour yesterday, but, but thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, staff for technically getting me on today. I'm uh, about 500 miles south of Hawaii right now. And I'm coming in on Starlink. Um, so I appreciate staff with the, getting me in. Um, I do have some comments on the pop, though, and um, I need to jump there. Uh, I told Shannon I was going to mention this. You know, the POP request for general fund is about $39 million. And that's if you add up all the, the various POP from the list that she had. Um, of course, the governor's office guidance is uh, very sobering 
this thing, our general fund can only be 1% of the 2325 allocation or $709,000, which is just horrendous. Um, I have two programs that um, I'd like to highlight. And I know that uh, a lot of the POPs are really, really important. And so, uh, but I'd like to at least bring out two just to get them on the record. And um, <clears throat> that is, of course, the OCRF, Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund, which is very near and dear to me. And I think Commissioner Calio could oh, yeah. chair that uh, committee that helped put that together. Um, can you still hear me okay? Then you just need a, somebody to say yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so the OCRF pop request is a million dollars, and that's for the general fund. Um, the other 40 pops uh, would be that would, wouldn't get anything uh, with a 709 million. So, uh, but OCRF is a is a really feel good program, as well as a really get her done type of program. It's got strong bipartisan support from the conservation and environmental community. We funded 142 projects since it began, averaging $35,000 per project. Over five million in total funding was awarded since 2020. In terms of federal funding, we've been able to secure some federal funding as a direct result of OCRF. One million from ARPA, a relief package, uh, five million in the drought package, <clears throat> and then uh, 2325. We've got a billion in drought package funding, and of course, we know about the five million in wildlife connectivity funds from the lottery bond sale that's going to go out in March of 25. It's a popular program, and we've received about $1.9 million in donations. And that's from people just clicking in a box when they buy a fishing or hunting license, and people <clears throat> just donate because they say it's a really good program. Um, the other program I'd like to bring out is another one that's near and dear to me, and that's the <clears throat> Wildlife Coexistence Program, which is also uh, uh, that, that's the one that uh, Commissioner Khalil and I chaired. Um, it's for 2.2 million, well over the 709,000 general fund we can ask for. Uh, so I'm assuming we can go ahead and prioritize the POPs, given all of this, hopefully get full uh, funding or priorities to uh, what we know, well, uh, even though most won't see the light of day, uh, we can at least tell the governor's office and our legislature what we believe are important POPs and get their attention and the 25 27 session. So I fully realized, and uh, talking to Shannon, we still got a ways to go, and this is way draft, as they say, and then we've got another public meeting coming up. But at, at least we need to, to make sure that we're pounding the table for programs that we all think are important to our department and fish and wildlife in general. So thanks for letting me get on the soapbox a little bit. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Labhart. And we will go to Commissioner King. Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, my question is, it's a, in a way a little bit of a follow up of Commissioner uh, Labhart, and it's sort of, I realize we're early in the process. Um, so just for the record, so that people are understanding, for example, if you look at our list, general fund is 39 million, and there's, we're saying we can only have 1 million or 700,000 or whatever it is. So what happens? Do all of these fall away? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner King, I love it when you ask me questions because it gives me an opportunity to mention something I forgot as well. <laughs> um, yeah, there there is going to be a lot that falls away, right? I mean, you can do the math. Um, there's there is no way it, it, it just doesn't align. Um, but remember again in the budget instructions, the governor has said they're trying. Um, to coordinate across the enterprise, get all agencies focused on the priorities. And one of the priorities is climate change. So how do we, as an enterprise, slow down the impacts of climate change? What can we contribute as Oregonians? And then also, how do we mitigate about that landing of impacts? And how do we make um, Oregon, Oregonians more resilient? And that includes our fish and wildlife. So I I think a lot of what falls to the side will be up for consideration as packages that align across natural resource agencies. So I, there will be a lot of, you know, com more conversations around water, habitat, 
um, natural working lands, those kind of things. And you, you're you very likely, I think, to see many asks for agencies rolled up into something different um, that all agencies could support. No promises there, but I know that is the goal. Okay. So I, I guess then how how does that look for our budget? For example, like, you know, like your pie charts that you always make for us. And, you know, there's this much in general fund, this much in other, this, you know, so how does it shift? Um, if all of these fall away, then obviously our budget gets smaller. <laughs> so, or, or do we start to get more creative about charging fees or like, like, and, and in being more inclusive about who we charge, not just the hunters and the anglers and the trappers, but the conservation arm, that billion dollars that's out there, that's untouched right now. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what I'm saying is that what this means, the, the, potentially this means is a fundamental shift in our budget. Meaning this, the pie chart of 65 million general fund potentially gets a whole, whole lot smaller. So Chair Wall, Commissioner King, excellent question again. Thank you for it. Um, these are investments. So our budget doesn't shrink. Okay. Um, it stays the same. And I I struggle with it too. So I would just want to highlight again, celebrate success. Like our budget and our amount of general fund is bigger than it's ever been in the history of this agency. So very much appreciate our partners being there, that looking for injection of funding source, but you are exactly right. You know, we've been at this, well, I've been at this for 15 years. People were at it before me of looking for alternative funding. That idea that will come that um, is in addition to our current revenue streams that really we can build and advance our efforts on that everyone can contribute to and see themselves in. That 100%, that's, that leads to this conversation and reemphasizes it again. Thank you. Vice Chair. Thanks. So <clears throat> help help me understand. Again, um, I, I I get this idea that the governor's office is trying to to you know um, build ideas across natural resource agencies, and I think that's makes sense. That makes some sense. What? How does the timeline of our priority, the other agencies' priorities? I mean, like I I'm confused about when all of those stars start to line up into something that feels like a something. Uh, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hathleton, great question. Um, I think once agencies put in their agency request budgets, you know, our, our deadline is August 30th. And then there's this long period where we're waiting to hear what's in the governor's recommended budget, December 1st. They That gives them essentially um, five months to work across the enterprise on those agency request budgets and see where we have alignment. And that always does happen, but um, there is in the budget instructions, they've lined out all the times that we will meet with our policy advisors, our CFO and the governor's office, and that's new. Um, and the meetings that they've scheduled, we're actually not one-on-one -on -one anymore. We're with Department of Ag and Department of Forestry when we're meeting. So they're already is grouping us and looking for alignment. And then the other natural resource agencies are doing the same. So they, they have built this in. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Director. All right. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so uh, next we'll go to our standing um, update on adapting to climate and ocean change. Um, so today we have Sarah Wright and Joanna Lyle and Craig Smith. Um, and while they're coming up here, I'll just remind you all that this year we're using this standing time in the director's report to focus on species resiliency. And um, we're kind of in a, a mini phase here on natural and working lands. Um, so last month we talked about ag and rangelands and this month we're talking about blue carbon. Thank you, Director Palmieri, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, members of the commission, I am Sarah Reif, Habitat Division Administrator, and um, very uh, pleased to be bringing you the Climate and Ocean Change Report this month. And joining me for this month's report are Joanna Lyle. She is our Salmonid Life Cycle Monitoring Assistant in Charleston, and she is online. And Joanna, can you say hello so we can check your sound? Hi, can you hear me? Great, yep, coming in loud Fantastic. and clear, thank you. 
And then also we have Craig Smith, Fish Division Senior Policy Analyst. So today's presentation is another installment, as Davia said, in our year-long climate report uh, focus on how we advance species resilience in the face of a changing climate. The, um, and the timing really could not have worked out more perfectly with yesterday's tour. Um, as today, we're going to talk to you about blue carbon habitats, uh, the important and outsized role that they play in addressing climate change, and how important it is to include estuaries and coastal habitats in the way we think about natural and working lands. As a reminder, when we talk about natural and working lands, we're including working lands used for farming, ranching, and forest products, and natural lands such as parks, open spaces, urban green spaces, et cetera. And as it relates to state and national climate policy, we've seen an increased emphasis on natural and working lands in recent years because of the growing recognition that these lands provide a range of environmental, social, health, and cultural benefits, including opportunities to increase climate resilience to threats like sea level rise, drought, fire, and other disturbances. But the other reason for so much emphasis on natural working lands is the role that these lands and waters play in carbon storage and sequestration to reduce Oregon's overall greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, when we think about natural and working lands and carbon sequestration opportunities in Oregon, I think most of us picture forests and grasslands and farms. We think about green carbon, right? Um, but here in Oregon, we have a powerful sequestration opportunity in our coastal estuaries and our wetlands, and leaders in the climate policy arena have coined these resources blue carbon. Oregon is emerging as a leader in blue carbon in part because the amount of habitat we have along our coastline, the quality of that habitat, and also the large amount of data that we have available in these systems. We also have strong partnerships working together to conserve and restore our estuaries, as you heard about yesterday, and really robust land use, a really robust, robust land use planning system that balances conservation and development, um, both of which you also heard about on the tour yesterday. So one thing we won't get to talk to you much about today, but you heard from um, Drs. Rumrill and DeAndrea yesterday, is the science and data collection efforts that our marine resources program and partners are involved in such as Seeker, um, and I'm glad you were able to hear about this on, on the tour yesterday. We could do a whole additional presentation for you on all of the data and science that's going into the blue carbon area and into coastal restoration uh, studies, but suffice it to say there's a lot of work and a lot of attention on those efforts and super important that that work continues, but for today, we're going to focus in on more of the on-the-ground actions that are going on and implementation of policy. Any suggestions here on how to get the slide to advance? Hey, point it up front. Got it. Okay, I'll point it that way. So the the main the main goal. Oops, did I go too far? No, that's it. Um, the main goal of today's climate report is to celebrate Oregon's coastal wetlands and estuaries. Uh, Joanna is going to lead us through a Blue Carbon 101 to teach us about our coastal and marine ecosystems and how they are powerful carbon sequestration solutions to greenhouse gas emissions. We feel very lucky to have Joanna working with ODFW prior to her current position in Charleston. Joanna was an Oregon Sea Grant Fellow working with the Nature Conservancy, where she was the lead author on the state of the science for Oregon's blue carbon ecosystems. After we learn from Joanna, I'll describe for you how blue carbon habitats are being prioritized in the climate policy world and with funding and help make that connection to the natural working lands initiatives. And then Craig will bring it all to ground for us and he'll provide some examples of where and how ODFW is implementing projects to restore estuaries, store blue carbon, and create important co-benefits for working landowners and coastal communities. And so with that introduction and framing, I'll, I'll pass the mic over to Joanna. Thank you, Sarah. Um, could, so I'll start off just giving a quick overview of um, blue carbon and the technical stuff. I'll try not to go too much uh, too deep into it and just kind of um, um, lay out the really high level because we could we could talk about this for hours. Next slide, please. As you may have experienced yesterday, I don't know how the weather was on the North Coast, but any Oregonian knows that 
a trip to the Oregon coast is not usually a stereotypical beach vacation. Um, you dress for the wind and you dress for the cold. Um, and in the summer, those really strong and powerful winds are responsible for driving these ocean currents that supply vital nutrients and forms a really fantastic foundation for biological life. And as a result, our coastal and nearshore ecosystems are really highly productive and biodiverse. And um, typically you might be hearing about this productivity in terms of fish stocks and economic statistics, but another way to think about it of this productivity is in terms of carbon. So at a really basic level, um, every living thing, every plant and animal is made of carbon and carbon moves through our food webs in different molecular forms. Um, plants absorb carbon dioxide directly from the air for photosynthesis. Um, and that carbon dioxide is you know, one of the gases leading to global climate change. So the thinking is that if we can protect these existing habitats that are drying out carbon from the atmosphere, and we can restore the ones that we were, that have been lost over time, we can maintain and enhance nature's ability to sequester carbon and store it for decades and centuries within um, you know, estuary soils and ocean sediments. There have been, as Sarah mentioned, several coordinated efforts within Oregon over the last several years to better understand and address these processes in Oregon specifically, because our, our ecosystem and habitat types are different than um, the blue carbon habitats in the tropics. So it's really an exciting time for us to talk and think about blue carbon and what it means for our state. Next slide, please. So when I talk about what is blue carbon, um, specifically it refers to that carbon stored and sequestered in living vegetations in soils and um, biomass in our coastal and marine ecosystems through these natural process of, of um, biological growth and death. Um, but it's not a straightforward process, and it really depends on this balance of the uptake and the release of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Um, you know, the uptake through photosynthesis and the release through respiration or decomposition. Um, these habitats are really actually very efficient at capturing and storing carbon over the long term. Um, but at the same time, if these areas are degraded, that process can work in reverse and decomposition can take over um, and release that carbon back to the atmosphere. Um, not all wetlands are, um, are carbon stores necessarily, and um, this proximity to salt water is um, really key. So the salt and um, and that salinity in the waters that, that fill up the estuary slow decomposition rates and help lock that carbon in place. Without it, wetlands tend to produce methane, as I mentioned, and that's a really potent carbon-rich greenhouse gas, and it shifts that equation towards emission rather than sequestration. Um, but managing these blue carbon ecosystem provides an opportunity to mitigate climate change by reducing those emissions or by directly removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And I do just want to say that blue carbon is not a silver bullet by any means, but it is a tool in our climate toolbox. Um, estimates globally suggest that blue carbon restoration, protection, and other management strategies could potentially sequester um, you know, about 3% of annual emissions in the next decade. Um, so alone, it's not going to solve the problem, but it's certainly, you know, one of the many additive approaches to get to where we need to be. Next slide, please. So where are these blue carbon areas in Oregon? Um, fortunately, we have these uh, blue carbon ecosystems kind of along Oregon's coast. Um, and these are in two general categories. Um, coastal blue carbon is, I think about it as estuaries. Um, and, and those include our eelgrass beds, um, salt marshes, and forested tidal wetlands. They've been really well studied um, and there are established practices to you know, enhance that carbon sequestration. Um, and a lot of it's you know, returning tidal flow to, to degraded or cut off former wetlands. I want to call it specifically our forested tidal wetlands. Um, 
these are, are ones that have, um, you know, they're, they're scrubby and shrubby, or they are dominated by a Sitka spruce cover. Um, and these Sitka spruce swamps that are, you know, they're salt tolerant trees, um, but they have just incredible carbon stores within their soils and within the actual, you know, the woody biomass of the trees. Um, but their, their carbon stores are on par with, um, you know, that of old growth forests or of tropical mangroves, which are, you know, um, you know carbon superstars. Um, unfortunately, about 95% of Oregon's historic spruce swamps have been lost and they take a really long time to regenerate. But those scrub shrub tidal wetlands are easier to restore and they're really efficient at um, sequestering carbon at a fairly high rate. So that is a, um, a really promising blue carbon opportunity. Moving on to marine blue carbon, um, you know, this is an area that's still really being actively researched um, and to understand the ways that we can enhance blue carbon processes and, and understand the potential that's there. Of, um, of the marine blue carbon, the best um, understood, but it's, you know, it's still an ongoing process of research um, is focusing on, on seaweed and kelp forests um, and their protection and restoration. Other ideas have been presented that aren't as well researched, um, include looking at, you know, marine vertebrate carbon and whale falls that, you know, pull down mass amounts of carbon in one go to the, um, to the sea floor. Um, the process of blue carbon sequestration looks a lot different in the near shore than in tidal wetlands. So our kelp forests, um, they really rely on the export of carbon to sinks that are not um, that are not the soils that are directly below where they're growing. Um, marshes and tidal wetlands, they're growing this, this carbon-rich soil in place, um, but, but that's not the case for our kelp forests. Seaweed and kelp really grow quickly and they're absorbing a lot of carbon dioxide directly from the ocean. Um, but because it's such a dynamic system, um, those carbon rich tissues, you know, they're likely to be grazed on by herbivores or ripped from their hold fast and swept many miles away before settling to the seafloor. Um, depending on the currents, you know, they can settle deep in the ocean where that carbon really, um, once, they get, once it gets deep enough, the carbon isn't likely to be re-released to the atmosphere. So it could end up on the seafloor, it could end up um, on beaches, or it could be swept into the estuaries and become incorporated into carbon stocks of our other blue carbon habitats. Um, and, and one of the facts that I like to bring up is up to a third of the carbon stocks within the sediments of our eelgrass beds are actually seaweed derived. So um, these blue carbon habitats, you know, in, they're in two categories, but they're really highly connected. And, um, I've been discussing these habitats in terms of carbon sequestration benefits, but I, I do want to acknowledge that there's really many co-benefits of conserving and restoring them for, you know, for people, fish, and wildlife. Um, they're providing a, a wide range of ecosystem services, which include things like a shoreline protection, water quality improvements, or cultural and recreational uses, um, really critical nursery habitat for salmonids and just improved species resiliency in general. Um, fortunately, as was mentioned, there's been dedicated ongoing work by others in the field to advance our blue carbon knowledge um, and establish these best practices um, and identify intersectional opportunities with other coastal uh, work and partners. Um, I'll highlight just one example, um, an effort by Pew Charitable Trusts and others um, work to map blue carbon hotspots within Oregon um, and create these detailed maps of, of blue carbon opportunity. This was piloted and recently completed in the Coos Estuary, um, and it's planned to be expanded to estuaries across the coast. Um, and that's really laying a solid foundation for collaborative blue carbon work. And there's a lot of examples I could go on, but um, I'm running out of time. so. I, I do want to just point out again, so as Sarah mentioned, I was I was part of this Sea Grant Natural Resource Policy Fellowship with the Nature Conservancy to co-write this report. And so that's linked here for any additional information. Um, 
And, you know, we found that Oregon has some of the best and highest quality blue carbon data of any coastal state in the U.S. Um, and so we're really positioned as a leader in this field. So with that, I'll stop and I'll pass it on to Sarah to discuss blue carbon policy. Um, I hope that wasn't too much thrown at you all at once. Thanks. Thank you. So now that we all have a better understanding for what folks mean when, they, when we talk about blue carbon and why it's so important, I'll describe for you how um, it's showing up in, in the climate policy context and in state and national initiatives. So natural and working lands really began emerging in the national climate conversation around 2017. This was when the U.S. Climate Alliance was formed. This is the bipartisan coalition of 24 governors, including Oregon, committed to the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and they've really encouraged states to take a lead role in promoting natural working lands as, quote unquote, natural climate solutions, um, but for both resiliency and sequestration reasons. Um, Oregon's participation in this coalition led to Governor Brown's executive order in 2020, which directed the state agencies to take action to reduce and regulate greenhouse gas emissions. In this executive order, Governor Brown also directed the Oregon Global Warming Commission, which is now called the Oregon Climate Action Commission, to submit a natural and working lands proposal to advance the state's carbon sequestration and storage goals. The Climate Action Commission released their Natural Working Lands proposal in 2021, and over the preceding two years, um, a series of working groups formed that rounded up the best available science and established action plans for advancing carbon sequestration on working lands. And then last year, in 2023, we Oregon saw passage of House Bill 3409, and that established a natural climate solutions policy for Oregon and provided funds to state agencies and private landowners to advance carbon sequestration and storage projects on natural and working lands. <clears throat> there was a lot to House Bill 3409. This was just one piece of it. This legislative support has now allowed the state to move from planning to implementation, and we're really excited to roll up our sleeves and participate in the effort. And I want to acknowledge the really important partners and leaders in Oregon's blue carbon and climate policy arena, helping us to get where we are today. As Joanna mentioned, a few of them, Pew Charitable Trust, the Nature Conservancy, the Blue Carbon Working Group, the Climate Action Commission, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, the, especially their coastal management program that you heard from yesterday, um, the estuary partnerships, the Tidegate partnerships. So there are a lot of players. Um, this is one area where partnerships really are so important. The Climate Action Commission's Natural Working Lands proposal in 2021 set goals for carbon capture and storage on Oregon's natural and working lands, and that led to a contract with the Institute for Natural Resources to develop this natural and working lands report that you see on the slide here, which included recommendations and priority actions uh, for blue carbon habitats, among many other habitats. Um, the working lands report uh, recommended protection and restoration of tidally influenced coastal ecosystems, citing two primary strategies. One is through direct conservation and restoration efforts, and secondly, by updating the county's estuary management plans with DLCD. And the report call also called for investments in sea level rise plans and estuary resilience action plans, <clears throat> and also for building incentives for communities and landowners to engage in those efforts. I wanted to take an extra minute here to highlight, um, and you heard from Meg Reed at DLCD yesterday on this, but the importance of Oregon's statewide land use planning system, in particular goals 16 through 19, which are designed to protect the long-term values, diversity, and benefits of estuaries and tidal wetlands. Um, land use is one of the most fundamental components of the climate conversation that has the biggest influence on outcomes. How we use our land, <clears throat> is the is probably the main driver, aside from emissions. Um, of, it's the main driver of change, and it's probably one of the most overlooked. So zoning and comprehensive plans drive the uses of lands and concentrate uses and how communities grow, how climate impacts can be mitigated, and it's just really so important. In our estuaries, we treat them um, like we treat the land in terms of use. They're managed, they're there are zones designated, 
Uh, we determine what can happen in those zones. There are shallow zones, deep draft zones, conservation zones, and there's these blocks of classification in the estuary um, that can be used to conserve habitat. But they, just like with land use zoning, it also allows uses and impacts too. It's really a balancing act. And that's where we have some of our greatest challenges is how you balance those different uses and different values. Um, I think ODFW has a couple roles that we can play in the blue carbon arena. One is we collect science and we provide crucial information to managers and decision makers on conservation priorities and how these complex processes work. Secondly, we can seek funding for and provide technical assistance and help partners implementing habitat restoration projects that also provide solutions for private landowners. And three, we can engage in land use planning processes, um, or in this case, estuary management planning processes. And we do all of these things. Our marine program, our fish and wildlife divisions, and our regional habitat staff all engage in these efforts and we really do make our participation um, in the land use planning piece a priority in the coastal zone. In the 2023 legislative session with House Bill 3409, um, this bill really was a catalyst in moving us closer to implementation on a lot of climate actions. There are many aspects to this bill, um, but today just focusing on the natural climate solutions component. The bill established a policy for natural climate solutions and defined natural and working lands to include blue carbon. Um, of particular note, the bill established at OWEB the Natural and Working Lands Fund, and it appropriated $10 million in general fund to this fund um, to go to the natural resource agencies, including Department of Ag, Forestry, OWEB, and ODFW, to support natural climate solutions um, as directed by the Oregon Climate Action Commission. Um, ODFW has since received approval from the Climate Action Commission for over $3 million from this fund to implement natural working land projects. And Craig will des describe our projects uh, that we're implementing in blue carbon habitats as an outcome of this legislation. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hapo Hyde, uh, Craig Smith, Senior Policy Analyst, probably the most excited person in the room to have Sarah go through that policy and actually give me an opportunity to talk about implementation instead of policy. So thank you. Um, so I'm just going to take us down sort of the work that ODFW and our partners are working on towards estuary restoration. Um, as some of the goals that Joanna pointed out, the main objective is trying to restore a lot of these tidal flows into our estuary habitats. But there's also some of those co-benefits that Joanna pointed out as well. So we're also working on what we can do for coastal community protection. So in addition to those climate policy and mitigation, not great benefits that Sarah has pointed out, we're looking at implementation along the landscape to where we can identify sort of these carbon hotspots that Joanna's worked to map within the Coos area. But we're also using other tools developed by the Nature Conservancy to identify areas that are priority restoration sites for fish, but we'll also provide that community benefit of protecting them from sea level rise, um, significance and severity issues that they're having with um, things like storm surges and like you saw during our tour, a lot of the flooding issues that are happening along the coast as well. The next slide. Um, this is one if we get there. Yeah, there it is. Um, so just taking us down that implementation level, there are many restoration activities going on in the estuaries, as you saw during our tour. So I'm going to mostly focus on the effort that we are doing towards tide gate restoration and replacement. That's mostly an effort that the division and the department has really focused on in trying to restore estuary tidal flows. One of the projects that we were successful in working on with several of our partners is a grant, federal grant that we secured titled Fish and Farming, replacement of tide gates to protect underserved coastal communities from the threat of sea level rise and flooding while restoring access for Oregon's coast salmon and steelhead to lost estuarine habitat. We secured just over $18 million for this project and we're working on four different basins in the Umpqua, the Nehalem, the LC, as well as work in the Siusla. 
So our vision here is to work and in developing a modern tide gate infrastructure that benefits both fish and underserved coastal communities. As a result, these communities are more resilient to the impacts of sea level rise and increased fluid flood frequency and severity. We really feel like this effort was targeted at not just a opportunistic approach, but we actually use several tools to identify where we have great ecological benefit. Okay. What this map shows you is sort of the great potential we have here in Oregon. Oregon's coast has 22 large estuaries and over 40 smaller ones. Most of this work occurs along private agricultural lands where we have a significant opportunity, if not imperative, ability to try to restore a lot of the carbon storage sequestration along the coast by recovering a lot of these estuary habitats. However, the fact is that we have over a thousand tide gates within these environments, most of them occurring along the Oregon coast and in the lower Columbia River. So there's a lot of work to be done. But we feel like with these habitats, we have a lot of significant potential to improve carbon storage along the Oregon coast. Most of this work is designed to involve keeping farmlands very productive. Behind these tide gates, most of this habitat has been lost, where we now see less than 54% of the habitat that we historically had. Despite that, we have a lot of potential and ability where we can work to restore these habitats. And a lot of our partners are engaging with those local part, those local landowners to try to identify where we can continue to develop these estuary habitats and bring back a lot of the tidal flows that are important to the recovery of things like Oregon Coast coho salmon, but also just recovering the great biodiversity that these habitats provide. Um, the second project I wanted to highlight is a work that we are working with nine different federal agencies to develop this tide gate programmatic. What we've asked the, the federal agencies to do is to combine a lot of their federal resources under the Inflation Infrastructure and, and Jobs Act to try to work with the state of Oregon and developing a program that restores tidal flows in many of our estuaries. So with this program, we've been able to secure $22 million to work on 12 different tide gate projects along the coast. The title of this one is again, Fish and Farming to Build Resilience of Stream and Estuary Habitats and a Changing Climate. The key to this is that we have developed several partnerships and voluntary conservation efforts. We've used the tool developed by the Nature Conservancy that's titled the Tide Gate Decision Support Tool. It's sort of a web-based map tool that helps us to identify where those traditional fish habitat metrics are, like the number of miles um, opened up or the number of acres of estuary habitat restored. But the tool also goes a little bit farther in developing what those community resilience goals are as well. So we can look at things like inundation, flood risk within this tool and identify where there's building and infrastructure areas that can be protected um, within these projects. What we've estimated so far is that these projects for this particular effort is going to be able to allow us to sequester just over 1,940 pounds of carbon equivalency per acre per year. So a great investment in this project to try to make that connection to carbon sequestration as well as the habitat benefits. Um, so just highlighting one, since we're here in, in the Tillamook Basin, um, we are working with the Salmon Super Highway on a project called Esther Creek Tide Gate Restoration. Um, this project specifically would provide 2.5 miles of stream habitat connectivity, but it would also increase carbon storage on three acres. The main objective here is to replace the culvert and put in a new muted tidal regulator gate that would protect the farm from future flooding, but it would also increase that tidal flow restoration between Esther Creek and the lower Tillamook River. What we've done is to, through the natural lands and working lands uh, fund, like Sarah mentioned, we've secured around $350,000, sort of a state match contribution to this project, as well as um, money from Business Oregon that has helped with some of the te technical assistance, the design aspect of this project. 
The other component is that we've secured some of the federal funding over $755,000. The main reason to bring this up is these restoration projects are expensive, but they also require a lot of partnership. So we bring in a lot of different people that have strong skill sets to help the different phases of these projects. Um, probably the largest project and largest sector is happening along the Smith Umpqua Basin. There are four properties involved in this, the Butler Creek, Glover, Kennedy Slough and Honor Slough projects. What you see in the upper right map is what our future inundation effort would look like in this lower Smith River. This is an area that traditionally has been blocked behind many tide gates. And with the effort that we would complete on this project, we would be restoring over 320 acres of tidally inundated land which would result in an increase in about 4.5 miles of tidal channels that would be restored in this. I don't have the time to go over all four of these, but I just wanted to highlight that I will go into a little bit more on the Glover and Kennedy Slough projects to give you an idea of the work that goes into these restoration. Um, once completed, we expect to enhance just over 20% of the total farmlands in the basin that are um, protected behind those tide gates. So a significant contribution to the farmland protection of their infrastructure as well as their buildings. Um, again, this project is, is probably in the 60% completion stage, but there's a lot of money and a lot of effort that goes into this. Um, what we have done is to help support and secure money through that Natural Working Lands Fund. Again, uh, $750,000 will go into these projects. Um, Business Oregon has also contributed technical assistance, but we've also worked to secure several uh, federal grants totaling just over $1.7 million for this effort. So this just goes into the Kennedy um, Sloop project, which is on the lower half there. You can see the stream channel that would be reconnected behind the tide gate and the blue lines, but you also notice the, the red line that's contributing to the boundary around the habitat. What I also want you to notice is outside of that boundary, that red line represents um, a dike area in there. We are proposing to reduce the size of that dike to completely inundate that habitat and restore the estuary right around 10 acres of winter habitat in that area. The benefit would be that um, those buildings that are outside of that boundary would be protected um, from any future flooding risk because of the project and because of future sea level rise. The habitat that's in this area is going to be greatly improved for mostly winter rearing habitat for these fish, but it will still allow the farmer to um, use habitat within there for their grazing and use of their farm for cattle and other things that they use on this property. So a lot of multiple co-benefits co that go into these projects. One. Um, the Glover project is very complex, to be, to be quite honest about this. Lots of lines on this map, lots of information here. The key is we just want to emphasize that there's a lot of project elements that go into estuary restoration. This project alone just works on removal of tide gates. It also restores several miles of channel, which you see in all the squiggly lines in there. Those are all the uh, former tidal channels that were in this estuary property. A lot of times you don't think about tidal channel restoration in there, but we were able to use LIDAR data and identify where these historic channels were at. And what we're gonna do is restore those habitats for future winter habitat for fish. Um, the other key component, as you can see on the map, there are several buildings and several infrastructure pieces that will be protected by using a muted tidal regulator that limits the pressure and the inundation of these flows that come in mostly during the summer and um, spring seasons when there is uh, active farming practices on this land. So the most benefit that we have here is right around 30 acres of winter habitat that will be restored in this area. And thank you, appreciate the opportunity. So I'll just wrap us up here. Um, the more we learn, the more we learn, 
And the more powerful the story becomes about what estuaries and marine environments can do to mitigate and offset climate impacts uh, via sequestration and through resilience. Anything you do to preserve or enhance blue carbon habitats has a direct benefit to fish and wildlife and often has direct social, economic, and cultural benefits to the people and the communities out here on the coast. We have an awesome opportunity in Oregon. We have so much blue carbon habitat, but the work is not without challenges and barriers. So it's worth mentioning those. Um, Craig mentioned estuary restoration is really expensive. Uh, we've had these once in a lifetime opportunities with the, the federal funds that have come in. But uh, I think our challenge will be how to sustain this work in the long term. Um, I also mentioned the conflicting needs that we have in our estuaries. Um, take Coos Bay, for example. Um, we have urgent need for economic development for the underserved and isolated communities down there. Uh, we also have protection needs for the finite resources. You know, once you lose those seagrass beds, it's really hard to, to get those back. We also have offshore wind proposals. We have container facilities, uh, housing needs. The, I mean, the list goes on and on. And so how to balance those conflicting needs and realize the intrinsic value of the resources um, is, a, is a real challenge. And then I would say that the third challenge or is uh, the uncertainty. We don't know what we don't know. Uh, when we learn something new, it can really change management paradigms, um, and we have to be able to accept and adapt as new science unfolds, and, and that, can be, that can be a challenge. Um, but we are doing a lot of data gathering, and it's supporting the notion that estuaries do play this critical role. Um, we have a lot to do. We have a lot to learn, and it'll take strong partnerships. We're, we're grateful for the partnerships that we do have, um, and we'll work very hard to continue and grow those relationships. So, you know, we've got some really great efforts going on on the ground that we're very excited to share with you. We are going to continue to prioritize our work in blue carbon habitats with particular focus on partnerships. Uh, we'll continue to engage in land use and estuary planning. We'll continue to advance our science efforts with SEEKER and otherwise in our marine program and continue to pursue those federal and state funding efforts to, to advance this work. So with that, we'll wrap up and be happy to take any questions you may have. Commissioner Labhart, go ahead. And we are running a little bit behind people, so just be aware of that, if you will. Go ahead, Commissioner Labhart. Okay. Thank you, Chair Wall. I'll be quick. Craig, I want to just thank you for your presentation. I don't know how much of it was covered yesterday on the tour, but um, up and down the entire Oregon coast, Tide gates have were put in the 50s and they're all made out of iron and rusting. And so there's a, a lot of issues with tide gates. And so I just want to give a shout out, uh, uh, as you did, to the Nature Conservancy, because without this uh, decision support tool that they helped fund, which was, it took many years to put that together. Um, there was a, a quite a bit of work that went into it from various agencies. And without that decision support tool, I don't think we'd be where we are today. And then I also want to give a shout out to uh, Jillian McCarthy from the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, who has been a key partner uh, with ODFW and others in helping to work with uh, this partnership and working with dairy farmers and others up and down the Oregon coast to uh, get these tide gates in place. They're hugely expensive. We want them to be fish friendly and they cost a lot of money. So I just wanted to give a shout out to those folks. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner King and then Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde. Thank you, Chair Wolf. And thank you for your presentation, you guys. Um, good, good stuff. Um, my question, I think, is for Craig, but it might be for Sarah as well. Um, these these tools that we're talking about, which um, help direct um, the need, if you will. Well, I, I guess I should say help define the need. Can you talk a little bit about them? Because one of the things that I'm most interested in, and I know, Craig, you're doing some of this work already, is additional metrics in those tools, like what you're talking about, the vulnerable communities, meaning, yes, it's about fish, but it's also about the vulnerable communities that are subjected to the rising sea levels. And so um, what's happening like with GIS as that's becoming more powerful, we're not just talking about hydrological models, we're talking about hydrosocial, and you could put census tract data in there and start to look at where the most need is. So can you just talk a little bit about that and how you're using that? And I'm sure that helped you direct how you got some federal funding and some of those sorts of things. 
Great. Yes, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Heffelheide, Commissioner King. Um, absolutely. We are using several mapping tools from U.S. Census data to identify underserved coastal communities as well as other underserved communities around the state. Um, that tool is basically developed through several opportunities where we can look at those communities and identify where underserved communities are along the coast. As you've seen on several of the mapping efforts that we've done, um, most of the coastal community falls within that um, underserved area. So that first grant opportunity I talked about, those projects were specifically identified in the Smith, um, the Halem, the Sius Law and the LC basins because they are in high um, to poverty areas that we've identified in the map. Um, so they are filling into that underserved community metric that we put into these grant applications. Um, the decision support tool that was developed by the Nature Conservancy takes that a little bit farther and looks at community resiliency. So within those underserved communities, we can look at things like benefits for improved water quality through filtration through these estuary systems. Um, some of the projects require a screening, so we incre increase water efficiency in the basin to provide better quality water for underserved communities. Um, the metrics in that tool look at mostly building infrastructure, road systems, and things like that. If we are going to um, prevent things like sea level rise and flood frequency and the severity of storm surges from impacting these communities, how can we best protect their infrastructure from any future damage? Um, and certainly with the project, we don't wanna cause any damage to their property. So um, the basic web map based tools pretty much put those metrics into there and we just kind of identify where priority areas are so that we can make those benefits happen on the ground. Thank you. Hi, Chair. All right, I'm gonna go really fast because we have a long day, even though we love hearing about this, you guys. Thank you to Sarah and Joanna and Craig for this. Um, thanks for bringing your heart to this work too in what you guys are doing and like, and you know, putting, you know, taking advantage of the moment, making things happen, making partnerships with people on working land, of course, is my a passion for me. So I love to see that you guys are making that effort um, and looking at, you know, disparity and trying to bring a lot of different metrics into fixing these. So um, I just, Love it so much, and I'm so thankful for what you guys do. I just want to add one comment, and that is that uh, thank you for yesterday and for um, the report and the work. Um, if I ever forget um, how the community benefits can play out with these projects, it's easier for me to see, of course, the fish and wildlife and habitat ones. But if I ever forget what it might do for communities, I remember the what it would have meant in the New Orleans hurricane to have had their wetlands, at least some of the wetlands, you know, some of them are lost forever, but if they had had some of those wetlands left, what it could have meant in those kinds. And I think of that in terms of our communities on the coast. So thank you for this work, appreciate it. Go on. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Uh, we'll go next to our um, annual Wolf Report, which is the report that um, we bring to you every April based on the, the annual a uh, wolf report that just came out a few weeks ago. So we have Roblin Brown, um, our wolf coordinator, um, Derek Program, Derek Broman, our game program manager, and Brian Wolfer, the wildlife division. Good morning, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, members of the commission. Uh, Director Paul Mary, for the record, Brian Wolfer, I'm the Wildlife Division Deputy Administrator. And as Director Paul Mary mentioned, we're here today to, to give you an update on the 2023 Wolf Conservation and Management um, Annual Report. Um, so to, to begin, you're gonna hear from um, Rob Lynn first, and she's gonna talk about last year and, and what we know about wolf management and conservation in Oregon from last year. And then we're going to move to hear from Derek Broman as a little bit of a wrap up. Um, we last were before you in December at the workshop 
um, to talk about the staff review of the wolf plan. Uh, at that time, we talked about some focal areas that we're really going to um, focus on for implementation and um, trying to improve our management and conservation of wolves in the state. And so we just want to take a couple of minutes to to highlight the progress that we've been making on on those three focal fronts over the last um, four months. And, and that includes things that I think when you when you hear from Rob Lynn um, on the annual report, you'll see those those themes um, that we talked about as still being relevant and were definitely relevant in 2023. The the hot spot in Northeast Oregon and trying to get a better handle on wolf livestock conflict, trying to get a, a reduction in um, illegal take and poaching, and then the need to improve monitoring uh, of wolves. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rob Lynn. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, Chair Wall. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Wall, Vice Chair, Commissioners, Acting Director Palmieri. Um, for the record, I'm Rob Lynn Brown. I live in Enterprise and I work at the LaGrand East Region Office. This morning, I'll present the highlights of the Oregon Wolf Annual Report for 2023. I'll talk briefly about their legal status, the things we have learned from our intensive monitoring, and the most challenging part of wolf management, livestock depredation. Hit the right button, Derek. Work the magic, Brian. I'll go ahead and start while Brian's getting that figured out. <laughs> the, the conservation and management of wolves in Oregon is guided by the Oregon Wolf Conservation and Management Plan. The wolf plan was last updated in 2019 and reviewed in 2023. In Oregon, wolves are delisted under the State Endangered Species Act. They're protected as a special status game mammal, and it's illegal to kill them except under certain circumstances. So what you're seeing up here right now is a map of the state of Oregon, and it shows a red line dividing the state in half. And in the the, the east zone, we're still in phase three, and we'll stay in phase three as long as we have at least seven breeding pairs. Currently, we have 12. In the west zone, that's west of that red line you're seeing on the map there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, we'll, stay, we'll be in phase one until there are four breeding pairs for three consecutive years. Um, so you switch to next slide. So this next map shows the federal status. And during 2023, wolves were and still are listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act in the western three quarters of the state. That's the gray striped area left of the blue line when it comes up. ODFW is the face of wolf management in Oregon. We implement the wolf plan statewide, but in the federally protected areas, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service makes decisions about harassment and take. East of the blue line, the eastern quarter of Oregon, ODFW makes all management decisions according to the wolf plan. Next slide, please. The statewide 2023 year-end minimum count of wolves in Oregon is 178 individuals. That's the same as at the end of 2022. We allowed Colorado Parks and Wildlife to capture and translocate 10 wolves from Northeast Oregon in December, and these wolves are not included in that count. The annual wolf count is done during the winter. It's about a three month period after December 31st. The minimum count is not an estimate but a, based on a population model, but although investigation into changes in our methodologies is underway. The count is known wolves verified through direct evidence of tracks, photographs, or seen on aerial surveys. Of course, there are more than 178 wolves in the state. A pack is defined as four wolves traveling together during the winter, and this winter we were able to count 22 packs. A pack is determined to be a breeding pair if an adult male and adult female and at least two pups survived to December 31st, and we documented 15 breeding pairs for 2023. Next slide, please. The wolf population continues to increase in number and distribution. Oh, is it working now? Awesome. <laughs> um, this chart shows the annual minimum counts of wolves since 2009. You can see the increasing trend in the number of known wolves continues over time. Again, the 10 wolves from Northeast Oregon translocated to Colorado in mid-December are not included in that count. If we had not moved those wolves to Colorado and they had survived another 12 days, our count would have actually increased by 12 by 
for the year. This map on the right shows the statewide distribution of Oregon's wolf population. Any area mapped in blue indicates a resident wolf activity or resident wolf territories. Per the wolf plan, wolf populations in each zone are viewed separately. The West Wolf Management Zone. <laughs> the West Wolf Management Zone has a large amount of forested habitat with deer and elk, but few wolves. We expect the wolf population to increase quickly, and that is what we are seeing. After, 30, after a 39% increase in the wolf population during 2022, we saw a 41% increase in the wolf population during 2023. The West Zone went from six to 10 wolf or pack territories over the last two years. As mentioned earlier, the West Wolf Management Zone is in phase one and needs four breeding pairs for three consecutive years to move to phase two. It looked like 2023 was gonna be the second year with four breeding pairs. However, in December, three members of the Gearhart Mountain Park were found dead, including the breeding female. These deaths are currently under investigation. If the breeding female had not died, the Gearhart Mountain Pack would have been considered a breeding pair for last year. But with only three breeding pairs documented in 2023, the West Wolf Management Zone cannot move into phase two until at least 2027, the earliest. Next slide. For the East Wolf Management Zone, the southern half of the East Wolf Management Zone is not expected to have many wolves. It's too open, hot, and dry. South of I-84, the wolf population in the central Blue Mountains is expected to increase similar to the West Zone. In addition to the territories marked here, there are at least seven more wolves in four different places that we're monitoring at the end of 2023. North of I-84 is where most Oregon wolves reside. And we have designated a single polygon there that represents the wolf range there. This method of mapping 20 or so separate wolf territories reduces staff workload. Within that wolf range, when a pack dissolves, other packs using the vacated territory start using the vacated territory or new wolves start up new packs quickly. And now we're also seeing new packs squeezing into areas that haven't been utilized before and maybe less desirable with more potential for conflict. As wolves started to fill in the available habitat north of I-84, the population was unable to grow at the same rate. There simply wasn't space. Wolves are intensely territorial and too many wolves in an area leads to wolves killing each other or dispersing away. So we expected that the wolf population growth rate north of ID4 would slow down and level off. Where the wolf population count eventually stabilizes for the area north of ID4 and other areas in the future may be based on wolf territoriality and on human cause mortality, such as for chronic depredation removals, other human impacts, such as vehicle strikes, human safety issues, and social intolerance, which can lead to poaching. Next slide, please. This graph shows a statewide number of packs in yellow and the number of breeding pairs in orange. We know of seven breeding females that died during 2023. There's no doubt this had an influence on the number of breeding pairs and pup recruitment at the end of the year. Five of the females died from poaching or are under investigation. We continue to monitor the wolf population intensively so that we can make an accurate count and identify any threats to the population early. We collected over 18,000 wolf location data pages in 2023 from photos, surveys, following up on public reports, and radio caller data. 24 new collars were placed on wolves during 2023, and 51 radio collared wolves in 29 different groups were monitored during the year. By the end of 2023, we still had functional collars on 26 wolves. That's 15% of the population. There were 36 mortalities documented during 2023. 30 of those deaths were in the East Zone. One wolf died of natural causes. A 10-year-old breeding female died of bone cancer. And for two wolves, the cause of death is unknown. Four wolves were killed in separate motor vehicle collisions, two in the east zone, two in the west zone, and one wolf was shot as a human safety risk. Despite conflict reduction efforts, 16 wolves were lethally removed for chronically depredating on livestock. OSP is investigating one wolf that was shot and seven that were poisoned during 2023, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement is invest investigating four wolf deaths in the federally protected area. Officers are actively seeking information about these and other illegally killed wolves. Poaching of all wildlife is unacceptable and poison doesn't just kill wolves, it kills other wildlife, our hunting dogs and our pets. 
We're hopeful that the rewards of up to $50,000 will lead to more convictions, but we need the public's help to protect and have shared wildlife and report illegal and suspicious activity. Reports can be made anonymously to the OSP turn-in poachers tip line. During 2023, over 90% of known wolf mortalities were caused by humans. Unlawful deaths were similar when compared with past years, but lawful deaths increased by 13%. This is due to the increase in lethal removals for chronic livestock depredation. The department continues to make depredation management and response a high priority with the goal to minimize depredation while ensuring the conservation of wolves. This graph shows the number of depredation events that were confirmed as wolf caused in the west and east wolf management zones. Statewide, confirmed depredation events decreased slightly from 76 to 73. In the west zone, depredation decreased in one area, with wolves depredating in three separate areas in 2023. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, USDA Wildlife Services, ODFW, and county compensation committees assisted livestock producers to reduce depredation. Lethal removal is not an option in those areas. In the East Wolf Management Zone, depredation increased for the third year from 49 in 2022 to 62. That's a 27% increase in the East Wolf Management Zone. Depredations continue to rise despite extensive use of deterrence. The confirmed depredation totals each of the last three years has been more than double the count of the previous five years. There's no single cause for this risk increase. We continue to look at many variables to understand the situations when livestock are most vulnerable so that resources are focused and manageably managed adaptively to assist ranchers. There is considerable stress and expenses for ranchers in areas where wolves are depredating. This chart shows the increase in depredations in the east in yellow and in orange the number of wolves that have been lethally removed for chronic depredation. Conflict minimization always starts with deterrence. In 2023, two new wildlife services agents started in Northeast Oregon. They are working exclusively on non-lethal methods. Regional wolf biologists working with the wildlife services agents have placed Fladry in more places in 2023 than ever before in Oregon. During 2023, removal was authorized in nine chronically depredating packs. Groups, 16 wolves were removed from five of those groups. Each time ODFW started with incremental removal of wolves, and this worked except for in the Black Pines pack where more wolves were later authorized and killed. Outreach is key to helping reduce risk to livestock. The department has been helping livestock producers with wolf issues for 15 years. Our five wolf biologists and many local biologists can share the depredation experiences ranchers have had statewide, including and since we have conducted nearly 900 investigations. We see some repeat issues over and over, like carcasses attracting wolves to winter feeding and calving pastures. We also share information with livestock producers about past wolf movements that can help inform their livestock management decisions. We share innovations that ranchers have thought up through the, to solve their challenges, not telling anyone how to run their ranch, but giving options they might consider. But we can do all of that better if we collaborate with other agencies and groups that are working on the same issues. During 2023, we worked more with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Wildlife Services, and Western Landowners Alliance. We continue to share important information with livestock producers and others on our website. There's information about wolves, wolf management, specific Oregon wolves, livestock conflict, as well as an online report form for reporting, reporting wolf sightings. We also send email notifications to over 13,000 people signed up to receive wolf updates. In October, the department released a short video explaining about wolf dispersal, which received over 28,000 views in two and a half months. A series of similar videos using Oregon wolf data are in preparation for future release. OD, uh, compensation is not an ODFW program. The Oregon Department of Agriculture uses funding from the general fund and federal grants to provide financial assistance for producers through county compensation committees. ODA award, awarded almost $500,000 in 11 counties in 23, 2023, up from almost 400,000 the year before. 84% of that was paid out to assist livestock producers with preventative tools and actions to reduce wolf livestock conflict. ODA also paid 100% of the value of the livestock for claims on confirmed and probable depredations. ODA did not pay any missing livestock claims in 2023. Now I'll hand it off to Derek. Uh, thank you, Roblin. And for the record, I'm Derek Brillman, I'm the game program manager. Um, 
So I'd like to take this opportunity, as Brian mentioned earlier, to give you an update on the three focal areas regarding wolf plan implementation that we addressed in December. The first focal area is improving the situation regarding wolf livestock conflict, especially in northeastern Oregon. This conflict is bad for livestock, bad for producers, and bad for wolves themselves as we've authorized the lethal removal of wolves to address the ongoing threats to livestock. We've been listening to producers about how conflict is affecting them and to better understand their needs in order to more effectively identify and deliver solutions that work for their individual livestock operations. Fortunately, we've been making a lot of progress on this front. For example, we've been uh, our agreement with Western Landowner Alliance is in place and we're using PR dollars of $400,000 over the next two years to fund a position in Oregon to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning, connect producers with technical and financial resources, and develop communication products. Western Landowners Alliance are in the final stages of hiring the position and have hired a part-time contractor in Northeast Oregon. In addition to the new wildlife services non-lethal staff that Rob Lynn mentioned, Wildlife Service is also working on, towards possibly adding two to three more non-lethal professionals using NRCS funds. NRCS, with their new Farm Bill money, is working on determining the priorities and practices they will fund, and we expect that those funds will be available as early as December or October to producers to put work on the ground. This totals about $5 million over the next five years. With all these new resources, there's much need for greater communication and working together between agencies, NGOs, livestock producers, and others. We welcome this challenge and opportunity, especially when it comes to greater inclusion of livestock producers and those communities. The second focal area is around poaching. We all believe that poaching is completely unacceptable. We are also very concerned with the number of wolves illegally taken in Oregon. This is a tough issue to resolve, but we are committed to finding a solution to this problem. At the agency leadership level, we are meeting monthly with OSP Fish and Wildlife leadership. These meetings include things like looking at communication procedures around wolf mortalities within and across our agencies. OSP has dedicated a trooper to review all recent and active wolf investigations to do things like look for trends or any links between cases. We are exploring ways to better utilize our anti-poaching communication and to raise awareness and have more targeted messaging. All the while, we are continuing with our regular conversations with wolf advocates and have discussed tip reward processes and ideas for changes in the department's messaging around wolf poaching. Finally, advancing our abilities to better monitor wolf populations is the other focal area for the wolf program. We are in the contracting process to work with Speedgoat, who developed our black bear and mule deer population models to develop a wolf population model and a monitoring program that would feed into that model. Model building, testing, and implementation will take time, potentially up to a couple of years. So we will still use a minimum count for the foreseeable future, but we'll be able to provide an update on this progress, say at next year's annual report. So here in concludes our presentation of our WOLF annual report for 2023, and we can take any questions that the commission may have at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Wall. And Roblin, do you have the record for how far your trip was today? How many hours did, you, did it take you to get over here from Enterprise, the Grand, or wherever you were? Seven hours. Galapagos Islands. Oh, good grief. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> Only seven then. Okay. Um, my question, and it, this is probably, I mean, I'm bringing it up, but the person directly to my right is more of the expert in this. And everything, nearly everything that we talk about with wolves, even though we're not saying it, the issue is humans. The issue is the interaction or or lack thereof. The issue is the understanding. Um, I still don't hear enough that we're bringing the social context of what's happening into the wolf conversation. And I hear all these millions of dollars, I hear these new positions, but are we bringing in that type of expertise, that type of funding, 
that type of thinking into this debate because so much of that would help shape say like the anti-poaching campaign and the and how we can kind of stop demonizing wolves we can kind of stop blaming wolves for being wolves and coming more to that understanding which would kind of come into what some of the things that western landowners alliance would bring into the frame with their four c's so i'm just wondering where we are with that um i know that i mentioned that because i mentioned weathering effect when we talked about this back in December in terms of, you know, discussing the wolf plan. But we really, I think we are remiss if we don't start to talk about the human aspect of that, like what's happening to our staff, what's happening to the ranchers in Eastern Oregon, like what's driving so much of this. So I'll let you guys reply. You, you can get started and I can add to it. Okay. So there's, there's two big parts there. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Commissioner Ch you know, Chairwall and, and Commissioner King. So there's kind of two parts of that. One is I'm really excited to be working with Western Landowners Alliance. That's that's a big part of this because one of the biggest challenges with wolf management is livestock depredation. And it's reducing the vulnerability of those livestock. And there are things that can be done, but that's a big change to incorporate in an operation that's usually a small family-run business. So there's a really big part there to play in offering opportunities and options to those individuals. And so that's a big part where Western Landowners Alliance will help. But you also mentioned the demonization of wolves. And so I think one of the things that we're planning that will help with that over time, and that's this understanding wolves, um, information sharing about wolf, what we know about wolves in Oregon. And so we did the first one, it talked about dispersal. We've got three more lined up to do soon um, that are gonna help people to start understanding a little bit more about what the wolf is. People are naturally afraid of things that they're not comfortable with. I'm terrified of sharks. I just spent a week in the Galapagos Islands, terrified of sharks, but I'm not used to sharks. Um, I'm used to mountain lions. I'm not used to wolves. That's the same for a lot of our, our individuals in Oregon. So a lot of learning more about wolves and, and the dangers that they really truly do face to people and to livestock um, is, is an important part of what we're going to be working really hard on for the next couple of years. Um. Chair Law, Commissioner King, I will add, so there's major emphasis in trying to get those resources of people that are essentially on the front lines right now. And that's where you too have, have seen these individuals and almost the, the shock that they've gone through. So that's been the, the first step, but I will say that at the same time, there's these this longer term plan of trying to get these resources in place. Um, but one of them is that Oregon State University is in the, the process of hiring a tenure track faculty position in social science that part of the job description is to address the wolf human life human interaction so there's going to be faculty on staff hopefully sometime soon to have just one more piece in this big picture this big puzzle that we have to try to address things um and certainly obviously will have to be adapted to we think we got the problem solved some new mole is going to pop up that we'll have to go after great now thank i'm glad to hear that because i think I under, we're mostly there. I think there needs to be that that acknowledgement that this requires professional help, literally. Like this is uh, it, complex, if we will. Um, there are entire bodies of research on this, and and we're not going to get this right until we bring people like that into the frame. Um, and I say that with the communication. I say that with the social aspect. So many of these things, and so. Um, here's hoping. I mean, I think it's going to take more than one Oregon State professor. I mean, I'm glad that that's happening. But I think, you know, that's the whole recognition is the first step to cure. Like, we really have to get there and start to bring some of this thinking into wildlife management. We got to start bringing in the people into the wildlife management and realizing what's happening with that. Um, otherwise, we're just going to keep shooting wolves but for all sorts of reasons. And and that's the reason why they, they're they not here now is because we shot them off the landscape. So like, you know, we need to like stop making that mistake. Um, and I say this from my point of view as a doctor, like, you know, we treat weathering effect all the time, but we didn't define it. Like it was the social people that got us there. So I think that's the same, we're in the same place in the wildlife space. Like we're treating, we're dealing with weathering effect all the time, but we're not defining it. We didn't understand it, you know? So we really need to bring some of that expertise into into the, into this place. And the Oregon State, I think professors to start, but I think there needs to be more. And I think that needs to be part of the things we talk about in the implementation focus of our WOLF plan. Thank you, Commissioner. 
did you want to comment or Commissioner Spellbrink and then Commissioner Khalil and then Vice Chair? Thank you, Chair Hall. Let me get the mic on. Uh, thank you, Chair Hall. Uh, yeah, just a couple things. One thing is, you know, I know we have our breeding pair goals for Eastern and, and Western. Uh, is there any goal for total numbers, uh, total population? It's supposed to be for you, Robin. Oh, uh, I can take that if you like. General Wall, Commissioner Spellbrink, uh, there is no set target, no maximum in our plan. No. Okay. I wanted, because, you know, I kind of did a little research here when I saw we were going to look at the, we had the Wolf Report, and uh, I think we all know, you know, Idaho is well ahead of Oregon on the recovery of wolf populations. Uh, in fact, it kind of appears like Idaho might have went right past recovery to uh, possible overpopulation. I, I uh, you know, got information from the the Idaho uh, Fish and Wildlife here and uh, says Idaho's 2022 population estimate was 1,337 wolves. Uh, says uh, now wolf Population reduction has been a priority of the Fish and Game Commission. Idaho Fish and Game Ed Director Ed Shrivener said, uh, said the long-term goal is to reduce Idaho's wolf population. We'd like to see it fluctuate around 500, which is outlined in our draft wolf management plan and aligns with the federal rule that delisted wolves. Uh, further says uh, uh, the department, the commission and department's goals are similar to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Endangered Species Act wolf delisting criteria, which suggests a management range of around 500 wolves in Idaho. That number would reduce wolf and livestock conflicts while still maintaining a sustainable wolf population and, and healthy elk herds. A anyway, so I, like I say, it kind of seems like they went right by uh, recovery and all of a sudden now they're worried about maybe having a few too many. Something to think about, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Folio. All right. First of all, Roblin, you said sharks, so we're gonna have to talk about that later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know. Um I want two two points. So I want to hear a little bit more about this position. I know you're in active hiring right now, but I'm curious the peer-to-peer -peer position that you mentioned at the end, what was what were you looking for in that role? Um, what are your hopes and dreams for that person? Because I think it's very different to have someone at a university, which is great, but also embedded in the department is a different, that's a different beast. They've got, you know, different priorities. Um, so we'll start there. Yeah, so to clarify a little bit about that position, we gave that money to Western Landowners Alliance they're the ones that are doing the hiring and choosing of that person. And they're picking it based on a very successful model that they have done in other states where they're hiring individuals, usually from, you know, hopefully from the agricultural areas or ones that have experience and have been working in social structures areas for quite some time. So they're doing the hiring for that particular position. And I have total faith that they're going to hire a terrific person. Oh. That's good to hear. Um, so my next question is on the livestock depredation response slide. So I'm looking at this graph um, and I'm going to pose maybe a dumb question, but I don't like that word. I'm going to pose a simplistic question and hopefully we'll see why it's not that simplistic. The question is, does wolf removal really help lower depredation? Because I'm looking at this graph, right? And we've got these years, ebbs and flows, and I know it's a short, you know, there's not that much data here, but we've got these ebbs and flows that don't really seem to correlate to how many wolves are removed. In fact, we see from 2020 to 2021, a near doubling, oh, double and more of depredation events that doesn't seem to go down based on the removal. So I would love to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question, Chair Wall, Commissioner Khalil. It's a great question. When you look at that graph, it's it's hard to understand that, but I think that the key is to look at it at a local level. So when a wolf pack depredates on an area in an area on those cows, the removal of those wolves that are depredating does reduce depredation. And and we do that after we've already tried non-lethal measures. Now, if you look at it statewide, it's not going to give you a very good picture. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, we don't know for sure why the increase has been quite to the degree that it is. After 15 years of having wolves in Northeast Oregon, we've got a really strong, you know, upward increase. But there's a lot of things that play into that. And one of them is three mild winters. 
So those three mild winters, mild winters are really good for ungulates, not so good for their predators because it makes the ungulates less vulnerable, harder to kill. And so then they're looking for other vulnerable animals, which in some cases might be livestock, depending on the, the management regime. So, so there's a lot plays into that. So just looking at those increases in depredation and the increases in the lethal removals is only looking at it statewide. And you have to look at it at a local perspective for that individual pack that's depredating. And that's what we're working at when we're trying to help livestock producers in areas that are having chronic depredation is we're trying to reduce the depredation in that particular spot. And, and if I might jump in real quick, Chair Wall, um, Commissioner Khalil, when we do uh, authorize non-lethal, this is to address the current depredation that is that is occurring um, despite the non-lethals and to resolve that. It's not to address future depredations. And so when you look at that, dra that graph um, and those future trends, we're, we're not conducting lethal removals in a way to um, – to try to address next year's potential for depredation. That would look completely different. Um, it's really focused on this current situation for this producer or producers. Thanks. Commissioner Hetfield Hyde. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, uh, first of all, I think I say this every year, I'm gonna say it again. Um, poaching is unacceptable, not helpful. Um, I am super interested just in the time I've been on the commission in watching more and more of that, uh, Northeast, uh, corner of wolves just shift and roll down, you know, they've been hanging out in, in the Klamath area for a long time, but, um, I'm really seeing and feeling the, uh, effect on communities that are kind of in that mid zone who are, are just now, uh, really experiencing um, uh, wolves kind of rolling through. So uh, I cannot even begin to tell you how thankful I am that we are bringing uh, more more tools to the table with uh, non-lethal wildlife services uh, coming into communities um, with Western Landowners Alliance, just giving bringing some more uh, help to these communities. Having said that, um, it's gonna. It I I watch some of these meetings play out as you guys do, and some of them seem to be really productive, where people are listening, they're learning, they're trying to connect with resources, and they can very easily shift into the full fear uh, shutdown. And I get that. I. I feel the fear sometimes, you know, of, of what's going on out there. So I'm not judging basically my communities. I'm just saying that we can become resistant to things that can help us uh, just by letting that fear thing overpower. Um, uh, I know there's concern um, about uh, uh, from, from some sectors. I think there was a, a, big article in the Oregonian about that this week, which I thought was interesting timing. <laughs> Everyone's paying attention to what's going on around the wolf plan and wolves. Um, I'm glad to hear that we did have a 6% increase when we look at the wolves that were shared with uh, Colorado. And I do think that everyone who is uh got a concern about what's happening happening with wolves should take a really deep look at the last even four years and how wolves really are rolling into all kinds of new territory and um, rolling around. So I think that's all I wanted to say about this. Um, I do think that I would like one more time uh, for one of you to go over exactly what we talked about when we upped the wolf plan in the fall of those three areas that we're focusing on. And I want to hear it out of you guys because you know what I'm talking about, right? Like the, the, three, we're doing, the three areas which are we're doing, um, you can do it. Not a test. I'm not trying to, <laughs> I'm not trying to do like a scary test. 
I just want to hear it because I think it keeps all of us focused on what what is the goal here? What is our vision that we were coming out with last fall? Yep. Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde. So our, our three focal areas are really um, reducing wolf livestock conflict and especially in that um, Northeast Oregon kind of hotspot area. Um, second goal uh, is really to reduce poaching and illegal take um, and, to, and to move the needle on that front. And then the third goal is to improve our monitoring of wolves and, the, and our methods for monitoring populations. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. I do want to mention a couple things just going forward. One is that this is a director's report and it's much appreciated to get the information. We don't have public testimony, but we do have public forum coming up soon and we will have four people who will talk about wolves as well. So we will hear short pieces from four different people on that. Um, and I also just want to mention that um, Sometimes there's not a lot of good news in these things, but the workshop that staff put together and that people from across the state participated in in December was incredibly helpful. It was a productive conversation and um, encouraging that we could actually talk about these issues with the entire spectrum of people in the room and make some headway and come to the three things of, you know, fewer conflicts, fewer dead livestock, fewer less poaching and fewer dead wolves, and that we will get better and better at our information. Those three still make a lot of sense. It was a great workshop and I appreciate it. And we'll hear more about this still this year. So thank you. I have one, one more. We don't have to go too deep into this, but it, a thought occurred to me and I want to put it out into the world. Um, when we talk about poaching and anti-poaching efforts, campaigns, et cetera, I think it's important to remember that there are Two, several audiences, but two audiences there, the ones who are actively doing the poaching and the ones who are allowing the poaching to happen by not speaking up, by abetting quietly, passively or actively. And those two populations need to be treated differently when we think about those campaigns. And so I'm just going to put that into the world. We think like it seems it's more unlikely that we're going to change the behavior of people who actively poach. It's not impossible, but it, that's harder. The people who are withholding information, who are allowing it to happen, who are helping out, that's going to be maybe a more effective first audience with our limited time and resources. Commissioner Khalil, it's almost like you've been eavesdropping on our conversations. <laughs> um, agree wholeheartedly. Thank you. Um, we will go on then to, thank, thank you very you. much, all three of you, to temporary rules. Director. Okay. Thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, we have five temporary rules for your consideration that were adopted since your last meeting on March 22nd. Are there are there questions from any of the commissioners? I do have one quick one. If somebody is in the room who could just mention what the 15 mile creek is, because it seems like we changed the season a bit on that one. It's the fifth one. OK, is John North in the room? If not, I can get the Here answer. Comes. Oh, John. <laughs> John, the question is about um, the temporary rule modifying the annual closure period for treaty subsistence fishing in the 15 Mile Creek Sanctuary. Yeah. The red button. There it is. I got it. Uh, thank you, Chair Wall. Um, Commissioner, or Director Paul Mary, um, that rule has been kind of ongoing for a few years. Uh, we've been working with the tribes, primarily Nez Perce tribe, to come to a uh, an agreement on a revised rule. Right now, the uh, permanent rule has that area closed at the mouth of 15 Mile Creek um, from mid-November to mid-June, and they have interest in shortening the end period. And so, because they want to access their Spring Chinook for ceremonial and subsistence fishing. And so the sanctuary was kind of there to help protect wild winter steelhead going up the 15 mile. But um, we've got some new data and it shows that a good part of the run is passed before um, May and June. So I think we have some flexibility. We're just continuing to work with them there to, we'll come back probably with a permanent rule at some point once once we have final agreement. Thank you, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Do I hear a motion on the rules, the temporary rules? Sure, I can read the thing. Here's hoping. I move to ratify the five temporary rules set forth on the April 19th, 2024 agenda. Been moved and seconded to ratify the temporary rules set forth on the April 19th, 2024 agenda. Those in favor, can we do a thumb, a thumb vote on this one? And we will also call the name for Commissioner Labhart, if you can, since we can't see him. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Then what we will do next, commissioners, is have a brief update on the recruitment process that that concludes our director's report um, and then go to public forum and then take a break right after public forum and come back for the, the long list of agenda items. So I will start with a, a brief update of what we have done so far, a summary of what we've done so far with the, the recruitment. We continue to work closely with the governor's office on the recruitment. We and the people who are working with us, including MODIS Recruiting, DAS, Department of Administrative Services, and our own staff here at the department, on this being, we are focused and they have been focused for us on keeping this recruitment process fair, open, and transparent. Speed's important, fairness is more important. So that's been our priority. Um, the update so far, and you know these pieces, but I'd like to just run through them. The commission heard public testimony on desired attributes and what people were looking for in a new direction or a new director. We adopted a recruitment plan, including the selected attributes that, that people were looking for. MODIS, the, the consulting firm, has met with more than 40 members of the public to hear from them about expectations for the new director. We got 23 applicants who met the minimum qualifications, so that's a robust field as these kinds of, of recruitments go. A screening panel um, scored those applications based on the selected attributes that we had already discussed with, with the um, people across the state and with this group, the commissioners. And an interview subcommittee has met now with and interviewed the people who scored highest on the, the selected attributes. So those um, interviews occurred over the last two weeks. Um, and the, the questions were formulated, including and incorporating feedback that we had received from across the state from the, the more than 40 meetings that, that MODIS had with people across the state. So um, these kinds of processes need to be more than check the box. And that's one of the ways that this has been fair and open and more than check the box because those all of those meetings with all of those people that MODIS did got incorporated in the questions and those interviews have occurred. Um, so we need then, we have a recruitment plan. We try to bring it here to update it. And we will look at that in a few minutes because we are looking at um, tribal nations are not regular stakeholders. And we would like to have them um, add an, op we will add an opportunity for those tribal leaders to meet the candidates between now and May 10th. And we're proposing that that happens um, May 9th. And I'd like the director to walk through next what the steps are be between now and May 10th when the commission meets again finally to interview the can candidates. So we right. go ahead with that. Please. Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, and it's been uh, my honor to uh, help you all in this recruitment process. Uh, so assuming the recruitment plan uh, updates uh, as proposed today um, are adopted, what will happen next and what, what you all should expect is that um, the week of April 29th, uh, the department will publish and promote an online form uh, allowing members of the public and interested staff, really anyone, uh, to submit questions that they think should be posed to the candidates during um, the May 10th public forum. 
Uh, we'll close that form probably on May 8th. So you'll have about a week and a half to send in those questions. Um, MODIS Recruiting will look through all of those questions. We know we'll have more than we could possibly uh, address in the time allowed. They'll try to compile those into thematic areas and try to um, ask the candidates uh, as many of those questions as we can. Uh, on May 3rd, the interview subcommittee that the chair referenced will meet in a public session uh, to consider what they heard in those interviews that the chair mentioned uh, and decide on the final candidates to advance to the May 10th public meeting. We're expecting that to be probably two to four final candidates. Um, once those final candidates have been announced, that's about that's about a week in advance of the May 10th public forum. The candidates will have an opportunity to meet with the governor, uh, an opportunity to meet with tribal leaders. And that'll bring us up to that Friday, May 10th commission meeting. During that meeting, each of the candidates will have three minutes to introduce themselves to the commission and the public. Um, and there'll be about 30 minutes, um, depending on uh, how many candidates we have, to um, where MODIS Recruiting will pose those questions that were submitted by the public. Uh, we expect we'll also have an opportunity for questions submitted by the union. Um, and so, as I said, I'm sure we'll have more questions then we'll have time for, but we'll try to, to cover as many of those as we can. After that public forum, the commission will go to executive session and interview the candidates um, and then come back to the public commission meeting um, to consider everything that they've learned from all of these opportunities and the questions that have been asked uh, and possibly make a decision on offering the job to one of the candidates if they're ready at that time on May 10th. Um, and so that is the the process that we see going forward um, over the next uh, three and a half weeks or so. Um, and then just a note for the commissioners, um, you will be doing those um, interviews in executive session. Uh, MODIS Recruiting is available to help uh, run those and facilitate those. And so if you have questions that you want to make sure we ask those candidates, um, you can send those to me and I'll, I'll get those to the recruiter. Terrific. Any questions, commissioners? Um, I would like to mention that on the recruitment update, the de this is a very, it's a small detail, but it says 10 minutes. We know that's going to be longer that, that each of the, at the pub, when we have the public um, session on the 10th for the, the public questions to come to the candidates, that will be more than 10 minutes that we expect that that will take. So just, we want to have everything clear on, on this process. So could I have a motion to Actually, just remember one more thing? Go so ahead. one more thing that we did add to the recruitment plan uh, during the public forum on May 10th, we are planning to have an open online opportunity for reaction from viewers uh, who might want to share something, uh, an observation or a recommendation with the commission. So we'll, we've added that to the process as well. Question first. Go ahead. I have, I just, um, do you have a question? No. Okay. Um, Director Palmeria, will you go over uh, again? Because I think that we're, we're going pretty fast. Oh, yeah, your mic's not. Turn on your mic. Oh, turn off my mic. Can you slow down and say how the public submits their question that will be reviewed on the, the day of the commission meeting and how that's going to be, how that information is going to be used by MODIS to outline questions. So sure. again, when will that open up? Because I think that's really important for people to understand. Uh, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, uh, we intend on April 29th to open an online form uh, that will promote uh, through our various channels, press release, um, social media, that kind of thing. Um, it'll be very simple and say what question I, I, I'm paraphrasing my future self here, but what question do you think that should be posed to these candidates in the public forum? Uh, that will be submitted to us. Uh, we'll just pass it along to the recruiter who has uh, a lot of experience with uh, crafting questions that can kind of capture the themes that they're seeing from those public requests. Um, so the form will be open April 29th through about May 8th. And so the recruiter will have a day or so to compile those. And then during the public forum, each candidate will come um, before the commission, introduce themselves, and then the recruiter will pose those questions to the candidate and they will answer in the public forum. Okay. Thank nice. You. Thank you. 
Do I hear a motion? <clears throat> yeah, I move to approve the revised recruitment plan for the Fish and Wildlife Director position that is dated April 19th, 2024, as proposed by Interim Director Davia Palmieri. Is there a second? I would second. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, could we have a roll call, please, Michelle? Khalil? Yes. King? Yes. Spellbrink? Yes. Labhart? Yes. Hatfield Hive? Yes. Wall? Yes. Thank you. Let's um, go to public forum then. And let me get the right piece of paper in front of me. For public forum, and we just in light of fairness for everybody who is testifying in public forum, as well as to the fact that we have a very long agenda, um, please, please keep it to three minutes. Um, the four people, five people, sorry, Bethany Cotton, then Saristi Kamal, Amarok Weiss, Stormy Warren, and then the final one is Paul Engelmeyer. Most of those people, I think, are on line. Just hit that big bar. Okay. Yeah. Great. Chair Wall, uh, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, Acting Director Palmieri, and the Commissioner. For the record, I'm Bethany Cotton, Conservation Director with Cascadia Wildlands. Cascadia has engaged in wolf recovery advocacy in Oregon since wolves began to naturally return. Quoting the Wolf Plan at page 19 through 20, in 2015, ODF&W evaluated the effects of increased human-caused mortality on the state's wolf population. Results indicated that a total human-caused mortality rate of 15% would still result in an increasing population on average, but a total human-caused mortality rate of 20% would cause the wolf population to decline on average. From 2009 to 2018, known human cause mortality rates did not exceed 10%. In 2023, that number nearly doubled to 18.5%. Accounting for the 10 wolves transferred to Colorado, Oregon lost at least 46 wolves in 2023, nearly 26% of the state's wolf population in a single year. We can be pleased for Colorado, but we cannot pretend those wolves are still here contributing to Oregon's population. Peer reviewed social science on poaching, which we asked the agency to incorporate in the 2023 wolf plan update, demonstrates that increased authorized killing leads to increased poaching. It sends a message to would be poachers that they are helping to solve a problem, absolving them of responsibility for breaking the law. This is playing out in real time in Oregon. Agency authorized killings are at a record high, and so is poaching. In previous years, we had one or two poaching incidents. This year, we had at least seven. We thank the agency and OSP for their effort to bring poachers to justice and hopefully to curb the poaching crisis. But note, it is not something within the department's control. Case in point, we have yet to have a wolf poaching arrest in Oregon. What is within the agency's control is how many lethal permits are issued how many wolves the agency itself kills or authorizes killing. That number was up from six to 16 last year, a 267% increase. 16 is double the second highest year. Pack numbers are down, breeding pairs are down, poaching and agency authorized killings are at an all time high. Respectfully, presenting an average gross rate since 2009 masks the true situation on the ground. It is not accurate to keep citing significant population growth. The last year we had any significant population growth was 2018 to 2019. Oregon's wolf population has only grown 1% in the last four years combined. This commission's decision to remove State Endangered Species Act protections was predicated on assumed minimum 5% annual population increase. That has not been true for four years. While we agree that we need to improve plan implementation, the direction the commission gave to the agency in December did not include reassessing the appropriateness of the rate of agency authorized killings. Given these deeply concerning population numbers, the minimum population stagnation trend, the poaching crisis, and the failure to achieve multiple baseline assumptions that underline both the removal of ESA protections and wolf plan provisions, 
and reduce predation figures, it's time for the commission to direct the agency staff to reconsider a liberalized agency killings. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Wall. Um, am I next? I'm having difficulty hearing, but I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, perfect. Good morning, Chair Wall, Vice Chairs Hatwell Hyde, Acting Director Paul Mary, and members of the Commission. My name is Dr. Shristi Kamal, and I'm the Deputy Director at Western Environmental Law Center. Uh, Welk is also a member of the Oregon Wildlife Coalition. Um, first, and as already noted, uh, the minimum count increase for wolves in Oregon is zero this year, and the count in eastern Oregon has declined two years in a row. When wolves were delisted from the State Endangered Species Act in 2015, ODF and W's model assumed a worst case scenario population growth rate of 7% to approve this delisting. We are down to an average of 1% in the last three years and 6.3% since 2015. Both are less than the worst case scenario assumption. Even if we count the 10 cent to Colorado as part of our population, which they aren't, it is still under the worst case scenario of 7%. Second, fecundity, that is the reproductive ability, is another important factor in population recovery. And for that, you need breeding pairs. Breeding pairs in Oregon have continued to decline with about a 12% decline last year, setting us back to where we were six years ago. Third, increase in minimum count has been about 1%, while agency killing last year was 9% of the known population. Agency-led killing spiked to a historical high last year to 16 individuals, and that's double the second highest number on record. Predation events actually slightly declined statewide, as you saw, but even if we consider the 27% increase in East Zone um, from 2022, ODF and W's lethal action increased from 6 to 16. That's more than 100% increase in aggressive lethal response. The WOLF plan has not changed since 2019, but ODF and W's implementation of lethal actions has. It shows how much discretionary and political power the agency's leadership has in deciding how they choose to interpret the plan, especially around issuing of lethal permits. They do not factor in climate impacts on the landscape or the prey, and there is no science behind permit duration on the number of wolves per permit. Lastly, cryptic poaching is of course a huge threat. We are seeing a significant spike in poaching and ODFNW and OSP is attempting to address those. But what's happening also aligns with what scientific studies have shown and what Commissioner King was getting to with the importance of human dimensions. Social science study has shown that agency-led killing signals to the public that the species is devalued or is a problem, and we are going to see a spike in poaching. And that's exactly what's happening in Oregon. Um, I hope this information provides you some additional thoughts and questions for the agency to raise later. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Saristi. Um, the next person is Amarok Weiss. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Paul. Good morning, Chair Wall, members of the Commission, Acting Director Paul Mary. My name is Amaruk Weiss, Senior Wolf Advocate with the Center for Biological Diversity. My brief comments today are on behalf of the Center and our 32,000 plus Oregon supporters. Later today, I'll submit to you a more expansive letter. 22 years ago, I was an appointed stakeholder advising the department in crafting the state wolf plan. We stakeholders realized we could not think of all scenarios, but we had faith that in the coming years, the department would adjust the plan in accordance with the ever evolving body of best available science. Our faith was misplaced. After years ignoring best available science, which concludes that lax protections for wolves and increased legal killing of wolves reduces social tolerance for wolves and increases poaching, the department's wolf management has resulted in the very outcome science predicts. 
Recent media statements by the department say they are alarmed by the increased level of poaching. A more appropriate statement coming from the department would be, we were warned and we didn't listen. We're ashamed and we're going to change what we're doing. So our actions towards wolves and messaging about wolves is not contributing to the epidemic of illegal wolf killing. Oregon Slack's protections for wolves began in 2015 when the commission prematurely state delisted wolves and then breeding pairs numbers in Eastern Oregon led to the department applying the lax phase two and phase three wolf plan strategies. The commission delisted based on the department's wolf population viability analysis or PVA as it's called for short. A PVA's purpose is to predict what conditions would result in conservation failure or biological extinction of a species over time. Four outside scientists with expertise in PVA peer reviewed the department's product. They found it to be fundamentally flawed, unreliable, overly optimistic, absent any discussion of the more than at that time already 100 scientific peer reviewed articles on human attitudes and tolerance towards wolves and using a very low poaching rate in its parameters that is not in line with what has been found in other wolf or large carnivore populations. The expert reviews were ignored and the commission voted to delist. The PVA found that 7% annual growth rate of Oregon's wolf population was a worst case scenario. The annual growth rate average since the 2015 delisting has been only 6.3%. Last year it flatlined. I'll wrap up with these two comments. The plan was due for an update last year. The department instead decided to only make changes in implementation. Evidently, that meant kill more wolves. It worked. The 2023 annual wolf report shows the department authorized the killing of the most wolves ever in a calendar year and illegal killing went through the roof. That's a travesty. It is past time for the department to stop ignoring what the science says. Thank you. Thank you, Amarok. Um, if we could go to Story Warren, and you also will have three minutes, and then we'll go to Paul Engelmeyer. Go ahead, Story. Thank you, and good morning, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, Acting Director Palmieri, and members of the Commission. My name is Story Warren. I'm a Wildlife Protection Program Manager with the Humane Society of the United States. I work with our State Director, Kelly Peterson, on wildlife issues in Oregon, and I'm a resident of Bend. I want to thank ODFW staff for their presentation this morning. Earlier in my career, I was able to work in the field helping to collar and track wolves, so I'm always interested to see the annual reports and where wolves are showing up. 2023 saw an alarming number of human-caused wolf deaths. Unlawful wolf killings represent a loss for all Oregonians and a threat to all wildlife. We applaud the informative video that ODFW released last year on understanding wolf dispersal. This kind of educational outreach really helps to combat the misconceptions that drive much of the fear and intolerance that is directed toward wolves in Oregon and across the West. The decline in breeding pairs in both the East and West wolf management zones is deeply concerning, as wolves were killed this year after conflicts with livestock. Killing so many wolves year after year as a reaction to conflict will not end livestock losses, nor is it viable to continue killing so many wolves, especially when young adult wolves from the East Wolf Management Zone are needed to disperse into available habitat in the western part of the state. Last year, five wolves were incidentally caught by trappers and one by wildlife services, and while the wolves were able to be released and the trap types and locations weren't specified, it is worth noting that current trap check times for coyotes on private land is seven days. Given the alarming number of wolves killed this year and the prolonged stagnation of population and breeding pairs, renewed focus should be on providing and implementing holistic strategies to prevent conflicts. Killing wolves should always be a last resort. If wolves are killed, then a more conservative approach is necessary as well as thorough and transparent documentation that appropriate proactive measures were properly utilized first. In 2023, several lethal authorizations for multiple wolves lasted for several months rather than 30 days. Such long authorizations do not allow time to evaluate whether conflicts have actually been resolved. Many livestock producers are using the preventative resources available through their county committees, as well as compensation for losses. To echo Dr. King, beyond providing access to funds and tools, 
There's also a need to help support producers putting in the notable effort to live with wolves by connecting them with the knowledge they need to figure out the most effective ways to employ those livestock protection strategies specific to their operations. Many producers in Oregon and across the West who have lived with wolves can share their tried and true strategies, such as low stress livestock handling, trained range riders, carcass removal, learning the habits of stable resident wolf packs and other adaptive management techniques. To echo, starting the process of reducing livestock's vulnerability to predation can prevent livestock losses, increase local tolerance and knowledge, and save both livestock and wolves in the long term. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Story. And we will go to Paul Engelmeyer as the last person on public um, forum, and then we'll take a 10 minute break. Paul? Yes, contact. Can yes, you hear me okay? and we can yes. hear you, and you have three minutes, Paul. Okay. So uh, I really appreciate these, uh, even as a short time, I want to draw attention. I'm going to jump back to the natural climate solution discussion and the blue carbon. Very good. Really thought it was really positive. I like the concept of the climate toolbox. So when I think about the climate toolbox, I'm jumping to another issue that's been on your plate on and off for a long time. It's beaver conservation. And so when we talk about blue carbon, you got Greg Hood doing study in Puget Sound, folks doing studies in, in Coos Bay, folks like the Watershed Council engaging in natural climate solutions. This is really positive, okay? And so uh, I believe Michelle has given you a number of documents. Hopefully they're in your pile someplace and hopefully you will get yeah. to take a peek at them. And I know that that pile gets pretty deep. So, um, but I'm willing to help any way I can. And so I'm drawing attention to the fact that uh, we're of investing, we're talking $1.1 billion, $1.15 billion to recover these watershed. I describe it as keeping Oregon, Oregon, clean water, salmon in the streams, you can catch them. We have problems that are significant. That toolbox needs to be expanded. And natural climate solutions is one of the pieces of this and beavers are a piece of the toolbox. If you think, or if you want clean water, you do know that we have 112,000 stream miles that are impaired, water quality impaired. I'm working on the Central Coast TMDL and trying to improve it for salmon recovery. That's my agenda, salmon recovery and water for our communities and for fish, okay? But we've got problems everywhere. So the natural climate solutions, and beavers are a part of the solution. So if you look at those documents that I've shared with you, uh, we get right back to the natural climate solution piece of the story because it's linked to water quality, water quantity, salmon recovery, a keystone species that's 60 plus different species, and yet we continue to kill these animals, okay? We have a plan that we can work with the public on private lands, that's positive but I'm talking federal lands. We are investing millions of dollars and we are getting ignored. The Forest Service made the request, our Syusla National Forest made the request already, it's five years ago, asking for closure. Tribal support, Watershed Council, NOAA support, U.S. Fish and Wildlife support, totally ignored, okay? So in any event, this issue isn't gonna go away. I urge you to embrace revisiting this because it is a natural climate solution piece of the story. And uh, we will have more discussions uh, with this, I'm sure. 17 evolutionary significant units, all of them dealing with the same issues that we're dealing with. That's the whole region. It's water quality, water quantity. And is climate gonna have a problem with this? Yes, where it's gonna be drier and flooded. Will beaver help? And the answer is yes. 1992 is when we started. We have not delisted anything. It's time for us to deal with this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, we will start again at 25 to 11, so 10 minute break.
And I see none. If we could have a motion. I move I move to approve the March 15 and 22nd, 2024 meeting minutes and with continued authority to correct grammar and punctuation. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the March 15th and 22nd, 2024 meeting minutes. Um, we will have a thumb vote except for Commissioner um, Labhart, who will do voice. So those in favor of approval. Commissioner Labhart? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes and we will move right to what you all are here for, which is the Oregon Game Bird Regulations. So I will let you introduce yourselves and go right ahead. Good morning, Chair Well, Vice Chair Hatfield High, Commissioners, Director Melcher, Melcher, Director Palmer. Was I the first person to do that today? <laughs> oh. All right, my coffee for everybody. <laughs> um, uh, for the record, I'm Derek Broman. I'm the ODFW Game Program Manager. Up here with me is Michael Klein, our Upland Game Bird Coordinator, and Brandon Reiches, our Migratory Game Bird Coordinator. And we are here to present our proposals for the 2024-25 Game Bird Regulations. Um, if that's okay with you, Chair, I think what we'll have is Michael go through her presentation, then we'll immediately roll into Brandon's Migratory Game Bird presentation and take questions before public comment if there are any. So, all right, well, if the head nod, it looks good. Uh, we will proceed with Michael, please. Thanks, Derek. Um, good morning, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, members of the commission, Director Palmieri. Uh, uh, for the record, my name is Michael Klein. I'm the Upland Game Bird Coordinator for the department. And I'm here today to present the department's proposals for the 2024-25 Upland Game Bird Hunting Regulations. Uh, my presentation, oh yeah, got it. My presentation will briefly cover the state of our upland birds in Oregon and our expectations for the upcoming season, um, including some background um, this year on how we actually develop the proposals. Uh, then I will present those actual proposals, including some special hunt opportunities and the controlled sage grouse season. I wanted to briefly touch on our proposal development process. Um, each year we look at the population trends of each of our species and consider anything that's happened in the interim habitat or weather-wise that is a cause for, uh, for concern. Mm -hmm. We consider other data points such as hunter effort and hunter success. Part, those participation numbers are, are also good indicators of what's happening out there on the ground. Um, meanwhile, we're soliciting feedback from our staff. You got there's there's um, Todd Lum giving me a phone call. Um, he does that frequently. Um, we're getting feedback from our staff and the public on how things are going throughout the year. And uh, we keep a list of anything that's causing confusion or concern that we can adapt for the following year. Go ahead, Brandon. Oh. Oh, Derek's on it. Okay. Um, we usually start out with a long list of ideas, uh, which are then distilled through a filter um, where we ask, is this proposal going to have the desired effect? Um, is it ethical and is it enforceable? And does it balance out the best interest of the species with the desires of the various user groups without getting overly complex? In the end, we have a refined list of proposals that has been given a great deal of consideration um, before uh, sitting before you all here today. Monitoring our upland populations is a challenge because many of our species are secretive. They live in places where they're hard to detect. And so this, this graphic kind of shows the different ways that we try to um, uh, evaluate how our populations are doing. There's certain spring counts that are useful for birds that return to the same breeding areas year after year. Uh, such as our sooty grouse surveys and our sage grouse lek surveys. Um, later on in the year, in the summertime, we have um, the breeding bird survey, which is more of a citizen science type effort, um, and our ODFW brood counts. They take place in the summer. Um, those are good for certain species, especially things like chucker, uh, where people really want to know how the um, whether it's worthwhile to travel out to Rome, Oregon, to uh, or not, whether to make the trip. Um, Whereas some of our species, it's a little less reliable, but because there's fewer, they're fewer in number, or they live deep, dark in the forest, and um, they're hard to detect. Um, our hunter harvest surveys are our longest running survey, um, and when we when we balance that with hunter effort, um, that gives us a good snapshot of what our populations um, are doing. These are supplemented with wing collections for for our forest grouse species and mountain quail. 
And then we have some species where we collect inf distribution information from the public to, to round out our knowledge. Uh, based on all this information, we uh, we have a good idea. You can go ahead and forward that. Oh, I pushed oh. the button. Oh, you did? Okay, great. Um, we have a good idea about what the short and long-term population trajectories of our species are. Come on, slide. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, in, in, whoops, there, there it goes. Uh, okay. Um, in, based on our, this assessment, we, we, um, I, I provided some examples, uh, maybe on your handout, <laughs> uh, which, um, which shows how we design a harvest strategy to minimize hunting impacts to populations. Um, in, for example, you see that in some species that are less common, we utilize a combined bag with um, more abundant species. Um, for example, with gray partridge populations, which are limited in distribution, um, we combine those with chucker, which are very widespread, and that tends to spread out the opportunity. We also do this with forest grouse, that's a combined bag, um, and mountain quail, which are a little bit more limited, we combine those um, with, with the more abundant um, California quail. For sage grouse, we have a very conservative controlled hunt with a short season and a small bag limit. Um, and for wild turkeys, which are on, on a steep increase, we actually have depredation seasons, which are intended to control the population. There, okay, uh, this is working. Um, as I mentioned, we do take a close look at habitat conditions each year to see uh, if we need to make any adjustments. There's a lot of resources at our disposal um, with you know, modern technologies to look at conditions on the ground. Um, up there at the top, that's our snow water equivalent. That's snowpack um, in Oregon as of last week. Um, and this is really good news for, uh, for Oregon in, in lots of different ways, um, especially in that driest part of the state that's over, um, snowpack is almost double the average. Um, <laughs> it's really great, it, but it is. It's also important to monitor our our fire history and our and you know potential conditions um, out there in in our fire map. The darker the color, the more recent the fire. Um, again, it's very nice to see southeastern Oregon is still doing a really good job controlling range fires in recent years. We haven't had a big one um, in a while. That's nice to see. Uh, of course, not all fires are bad. And in the upland bird, uh, we have species like rough grouse and mountain quail that like that earlier succession, and they're actually thriving in those post-fire habitats, that, the ones that didn't burn to a crisp, right? Um, we also take a look at the Conservation Reserve Program enrollment. Um, these are really important to our birds in the Columbia Basin. Um, Oregon has 600,000 acres of, of Conservation Reserve Program enrolled. Um, which is almost three percent of the nation's um, total, which is which is great for Oregon. Which you know, if you if you look across the landscape, it's not uh, it's not all dry land farming, um, but we have a good component of crop reserve of conservation reserve program. Okay, with that, um, I'd like to dive into our proposals. Um, I do need to remind you about the five year upland framework. Um, so in um, back in 2020, this commission approved um, a five-year framework for upland birds. So we're in the last year of that framework. Um, the, the concept is that upland populations fluctuate uh, quite a bit each year, but there's not a need to adjust the bag limits and season dates every year. These are birds with short lives and high production. Um, and so as long as we're staying within reasonable harvest rates, we're not contributing additional mortality beyond that sort of naturally high death rate. Hunters also tend to be self-limiting in, in poor production years. You'll see that hunters don't spend as much effort out there trying to find birds and they'll go do something else. Um, and so, so we do find that hunters are self-limiting. Um, so in 2025, it'll be time to revisit um, the upland framework, and we'll be looking, taking a really close look at season lengths and bag limits for, for all of our species. Um, this doesn't prevent us from making changes in the interim if something does come up, um, but based on the analysis of our available data, um, uh, we support maintaining the seasons within the current framework. 
except for turkeys. <laughs> turkeys continue to be on the increase. Uh, last year, we uh, we introduced the beardless turkey permit um, product, which was um, utilized in and around Grant County. And so reporting back to you on how that went, uh, we have about uh, 17 landowners that we know of in Grant County that utilize this product. Um, we just got our mandatory harvest rep reporting data back, and um, we... Um, we estimate a little over 200 turkeys were harvested. Um, and of course, this, these are beardless turkeys. Most, Some of them were young males that didn't have their beards yet, but they were mostly females, um, at least as far as the hunters reported it. Um, and the landowners who allowed the most hunting reported the most relief um, from, from turkey damage and nuisance, um, just because the presence of hunters has a hazing effect. Uh, the feedback from the district uh, is that they'd like to extend that permit through the end of February. It was through the end of January um, because winter really didn't hit out there until after the season. And then they had to do an emergency hunt instead. Um, and I, they would have preferred to have just kept that beardless permit season rolling. Um, they also would like to extend their boundaries slightly. So you see in the red text that 37 and 65, that's the... Um, that's the Ochico and the Beulah units. So they just want to extend the boundaries slightly to include some landowners who would have benefited from this product. I'll show you a map in a second. Um, and that did have a little bit of a cascading effect on our fall season boundaries. Um, so those th that expansion would allow a September 1 opener in the fall just on the, on the, the outside um, of our existing map. And then finally, finally, our districts in the Willamette Valley are interested in trying the beardless turkey permit um, this season and have outlined an area to try. Um, the only difference in their rules is um, we would like to exclude private industrial timberland or forest land as defined by um, ODF forestry um, from the season as the turkeys, turkeys on those types of lands are really not creating damage problems. And, and so if we have um, people flushing birds out of private industrial forest land onto uh, farmsteads, um, that's not the desired effect that we're going for. So um, we, would, we would like hunters to kind of keep to those areas where the turkeys are actually causing problems. So I'll show you the map. Um, so in the orange, of course, is the, the, the proposed Willamette um, area boundary that would um, exclude private industrial forest land. And then in the red circles, that's the expansion, just that tiny little bit of Beulah um, over by Prairie City, and then a little bit of the Ochico unit. Okay, next it is time to discuss the sage grouse controlled hunt. Um, I will cover the status of sage grouse and give a quick review of our permit calculation process and provide the recommendation. Um, I will keep this to a higher level this year. Um, I promise, because I know we've done the deep dive in the past, um, but happy to answer questions um, uh, as needed. Um, we do know a lot about our sage grouse populations because we monitor them very closely. Um, reminder that they're not a listed species, but one that we have concerns about long-term declines. Um, we do have an army of biologists that goes out and counts sage grouse on the Lex each spring. This is from last spring, these pictures, and that's what the landscape looked like. It was unbelievable. Um, look at that poor sage grouse on an island. <laughs> so um, we had a hard time counting sage grouse last spring. Um, it was just hard to access some of these areas. Um, so we need to take that into account as we look at the numbers that came back um, and, and, and consider um, some supplementary data um, to make sure that we understand how the population is actually doing. Um, so uh, moving on to the population estimates, uh, in blue you see the average, um, uh, let's see, Average males, or no, minimum spring population estimate is in blue and average males per lek um, complex in red from 1980 to the present. Um, you can uh, note there's a cyclical nature to sage grouse populations. They go through natural peaks and troughs. Um, uh, according to what we were able to count last year, we dipped below that our most recent peak um, this past year. Uh, the long-term trend represents a change in the carrying capacity out there on the landscape. Uh, which is primarily due to, to um, some very large wildfires and what happened after those fires, what came in. Those invasive annual grasses um, just don't make for, um, for sage grouse habitat. Um, in addition, um, from the higher elevations, we have western juniper moving in um, 
And uh, that's really putting the squeeze on our sage grouse and has reduced the capacity out there on the ground. Um, we are lucky that we still have very large expanses of functioning sagebrush habitat uh, and lots of people who are working um, on those issues um, on the ground as well as on the policy level. So when, when analysis was complete, overall we were down about 12% from the previous year, but it varied across the landscape really depending on where we could get um, to the LEXT account. So that there's um, BLM districts are, are on the map um, and the trends out there. Uh, and so uh, we were not able to get to some southeastern Malheur County last year. Um, and there's some really big lecks down there. So we're taking that number with a grain of salt and we're really looking forward to seeing what this year holds. Um, we have some uh, some other indicators that last year's conditions were a net positive for sage grouse. Uh, in the past, we've talked about the value of our wing collections that our hunters submit um, in understanding the structure of sage grouse populations. So, you know, with those wings, you can estimate nest success. You can um, calculate the peak hatch date, the age, and the sex ratios of the population. Uh, and this information is is really difficult to collect without um, without our hunters. Um, based on last year's fall sample of 246 wings, we found 2.48 chicks per hen in the sample, which exceeds our long-term average significantly by one point. Uh, our long-term average is 1.46. Um, and last year's number also exceeds a threshold that science says is needed for population increase. So that was great to see. Um, harvest was also comprised of 61% juveniles last year, which far exceeds our average of 47%. Um, so lots of young birds on the ground. Um, uh, and this, frankly, it's the highest indicator of production in sage grouse we've had since we started collecting data. Um, our biologists are in the middle of lex surveys right now. They're out there on the ground. Skylar Vold, you remember he came and presented the sage grouse maps. Um, he uh, reports that counts appear to be up in most areas and they're seeing really strong female attendance at the lex. Um, he also has been doing some flights over the Pueblos um, and they found 10 potential new lex and four of them had over 20 males attending, which is really great. Um, Yes, uh, so based on this information, we are recommending proceeding with the sage grouse controlled hunt in 2024. Uh, we follow specific guidelines on when to open or close sage grouse hunting seasons and units um, as outlined in Oregon's sage grouse action plan. Um, this acknowledges that hunts can be conducted without impact to the population and these are the guidelines we follow today. Um, specifically, uh, the department sets permit numbers to allow harvest of less than 5% of the projected fall population, and we do not hunt in units with less than 100 males in consecutive years. And these guidelines are based on published research and accepted by WAFWA. Uh, just real quick, this, this next slide represents the math that goes into calculating those permits. Um, so we figure out what the fall population is. Some of that is based on our wing collection data, our spring lek counts, um, and our harvest surveys. And then uh, we figure out what that 5% is, um, and we figure in hunter participation and success rates. Um, and we have been very successful in staying below that 5%. Typically, we're in the 2 to 3% range. Our recommendation for the controlled sage grouse season is a nine day season from September 7th to the 15th with a season limit of two sage grouse. Uh, we will um, we propose to initially set those permit levels at last year's levels and we'll make adjustments as needed by temporary rule when the let counts are entered and analyzed later this summer. My last slide um, represents our special hunting seasons that occur outside the regular season dates and do require commission approval. These include the Western Oregon Fee Pheasant Hunt, um, the fe uh, Pheasant Hunting Workshop, um, a family pheasant hunt, uh, which is organized by Hunters of Color. Um, that was a real success last year and they, they wanna do two days this year. Uh, we have 11 youth pheasant hunts, um, a youth chucker hunt, and our falconry season. So those are the special hunt opportunities. Um, with that, I would like to conclude my portion of the presentation, hand the mic to my colleague, Brandon Reiches. <clears throat> all right, hopefully my voice holds up. This is the best it sounded all week. <laughs> so good morning, Chair Wall, <laughs> Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, members of the commission, and Director Paul Mary. For the record, my name is Brandon Reiches. I'm the migratory game bird 
coordinator for the department. And I'm here today to present the department's proposals <clears throat> for the 2024-25 migratory game bird hunting regulations. Oregon is blessed with a plethora of migratory game bird resources with 36 regular occurring hunted species and five species which are not hunted. The majority of these are ducks with 27 regularly occurring species, 20 of which with nest in the state. There are six species of geese divided into 11 different management populations, though only one Western Canada goose nests here. We also have three hunted migratory upland game bird species, bantail pigeon, morning dove, and Wilson snipe. All of these species nest here. And finally, there are five migratory game bird species which are commonly found in Oregon, which are not hunted, trumpeter and tundra swan, sandhill crane, and soar and Virginia rail. All of these except the tundra swan nest here. <clears throat> so we've just seen that migratory game bird program is responsible for dozens of species that depend on a variety of habitat. And we work at many different scales with a variety of partners to conserve, restore, and improve these places for these birds. Additionally, as hunted species, there are a variety of programs in place to measure the health of the populations and monitor harvest. <clears throat> Habitat conservation for migratory game birds takes many forms. And since birds here in Oregon depend on habitats from Canada to Mexico or beyond, occurs at many scales. The conservation model for waterfowl set up under the North American <clears throat> Waterfowl Management Plan has been a resounding success since its inception nearly 40 years ago. Recall that when compared to other groups of birds, most waterfowl have seen positive population trends over the past 50 years, whereas many other types of birds have experienced persistent declines. A few examples of how the department plugs into waterfowl habitat conservation <clears throat> are providing funding to habitat work in Canada through Office Fall Flights Program working with migratory game, the migratory game, the migratory bird joint ventures at the regional scale and literally getting our hands dirty at our wildlife areas where we manipulate the landscape to provide high quality habitat for waterfowl and other wildlife. Monitoring of our migratory game bird resources happens at three main pillars, population survey, banding and harvest survey. Each of these programs plays a key role in the monitoring of our migratory game bird resources, as well as helping make appropriate harvest management decisions. Population monitoring of our migratory game bird resources takes many forms, but perhaps the most well known <clears throat> are aerial waterfowl surveys. OFW staff have been conducting standardized breeding waterfowl surveys across Oregon since 1994. Each spring, our biologists fly about 1,500 miles of transects and helicopters across the state and record all the breeding waterfowl and sandhill cranes they see. This information <clears throat> gives us an idea of how our local breeding populations are faring, but we are just a small part in a much bigger picture. Each spring since 1955, the Fish and Wildlife Service and their Canadian partners have surveyed many thousands of miles of transects across the heart of the breeding range on the continent. These surveys give us a good look at the health of most waterfowl populations we have. Several other Pacific Flyway states, such as California and Washington, conduct these same surveys, and department funding through the Flyway Council helps fund surveys in British Columbia. Staff also conduct many other migratory game bird surveys, such as Bantail Pigeon Mineral Spring Surveys, Dusky Cackling and Aleutian Goose Mark Resite Surveys, Midwinter Brant Surveys, December swan and snow goose and December swan and snow, snow goose surveys. Staff also conducts some USGS breeding bird survey routes, which help assess population status for the webless game birds, such as snipe. In nearly all cases, our work is combined with survey information from other states and provinces to look at the health of the overall population, not just the birds breeding or wintering here in Oregon. <clears throat> Banding bridges the gap between population monitoring and harvest management. On one hand, we can use banding information to estimate the population size using capture recapture methodology like we do for doves, 
or assess annual survival like we do for Can dusky Canada geese. ODFW staff participate in the National Morning Dove Banding Program, usually banding between 700 and 1,000 doves each summer. These numbers, along with banding information from other states, helps the Fish and Wildlife Service estimate the morning dove population size in the flyways. Our biologists also contribute to the preseason waterfowl banding program. This information is used to track the harvest rate for many different species of ducks and geese. And we also provide financial contributions or even staff to support operations in far-flung Arctic areas, such as Banks Island, Canada, or the Yukon Kuskokum Delta in Alaska. Mallards are one of the most important species banded during these banding operations, and that banding information gathered throughout the flyways feeds directly into mallard population and harvest models that guide duck season frameworks. In a typical summer, our staff banned about 3,000 mallards and 2,600 other ducks, but, and that's about 22% of the mallards banded in this flyway. And then lastly, our marking activities contribute to the understanding of the natural history of our migratory game birds. For example, we recently partnered with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game to capture and mark Taverner's cackling geese and lesser Canada geese at Savi Island. And this work's gonna help us learn more information about habitat use, migration and nesting areas for these birds and will help the flyway manage, help flyway managers make more informed conservation decisions in the future. The final pillar is harvest monitoring. Like other aspects of the migratory game bird management, the states and the service cooperate extensively to determine the level of harvest that results from the seasons you adopt. The steps here are that the states identify who is a potential migratory game bird hunter using state-issued state HIP validations or harvest information program. The service then sends surveys out to a sample of those hunters to determine their effort. And finally, the states and the service analyze wings and tails those hunters submit to determine the species, age, and sex composition of the harvest. <clears throat> Typically, the department sends four to six staff to the Pacific Flyway Waterfowl Wing Bee, where more than 20,000 duck wings and goose tails are examined. We have also sent staff to the Morning Dove Wing Bee, where some information is collected. <clears throat> Finally, we can take the monitoring information, the results of which are dependent on the habitat conditions and put it together with the feedback we get from the public into season recommendations. Whether these are based on explicit adaptive harvest management protocols, flyway council harvest strategies, or just basic monitoring information, we can feel confident we are making an appropriate recommendation, which allows harvest opportunity and realized harvest commensurate with the population status. Now on to the proposals. The 2024-25 season analysis of the available data supports maintaining the harvest opportunity offered in prior seasons. Season timing would also remain similar to past seasons, except for calendar shift and a recommendation to modify the season structure in the mid-Columbia goose zone. Three seasons ago, we authorized the first late winter goose hunt in this zone to allow late season harvest on a growing wintering flock of snow geese. To accomplish this, we had to shift season days from October into February. However, feedback from the hunters and landowners in the area um, suggests that they would prefer to continue hunting in October. Due to federal limitations, we simply cannot add days to the season. We need to shift days from somewhere else within the season. So we're proposing to shift the hunting days from January into October. <clears throat> On the screen are a few of the popular opening dates, and I would note that like last, year, like last year, we are proposing to open both duck hunting zones on the same day, October 12. Next, um, I do need to point out an error in the materials that you received, specifically attachment three, page 41, the falconry season dates for migratory game birds. Uh, we've submitted an addendum, and this addendum modifies the season dates from duck, including merganser, morning dove, and bantail pigeon of, of September 1 to December 16 to duck, including merganser, concurrent with the gun season, goose, concurrent with the gun season, except no falconry seasons in September Canada goose, in any September Canada goose season 
for the Northwest permit goose season and morning dove and bantail pigeon, September 1 to December 16. Essentially what simply happened is we had a deletion that deleted the season for ducks, all of the goose information, and essentially combined it with doves, which was incorrect. We apologize for that. An additional proposal the department is proposing to change the way reservation duck hunt, reservation hunters check in at our wildlife areas. Currently, hunters who draw a controlled hunt permit for Fern Ridge, Saw the Island, or Klamath Wildlife Area must then purchase that $2 permit to prove to check station staff they have a <laughs> reservation hunt for that specific day. Through efficiencies in the ELS system, the department can easily produce lists of the reservation holders and use those lists to cross-reference hunters' names from their hunting license when they check in, negating the need for hunters to purchase the $2 permit and speeding up the check-in process. Hunters will still be required to have a daily hunt harvest permit provided free of charge by the check station staff to track hunter effort and harvest. And lastly, we are proposing to make some minor changes to the game bird and habitat conservation stamp art contest rules. First, we're proposing that instead of being fixed in administrative rule, the artwork submission deadline and the winning award amount be set via contest rules, which are posted each year on our website. The second change would require that artists include a postage paid return label with the submission of their artwork. These changes would provide the department with more flexibility as to when to hold the contest, how much to award the winner, and allow the artist to select the appropriate amount of return insurance they desire on their artwork, as well as use their shipping carrier of choice. And with that, we can take any questions. Thank you. Commissioner's questions, Commissioner King. And we do have one from um, Commissioner Lavhart. I believe he would like to talk about one of the items. Commissioner King. Yes, thank you. Thank you, guys. And as always, you bring in the lapel pins that I love. Um, <laughs> Michael, my question for you is, and I, you touched on it, I think. Um, I remember when we changed some of the turkey regs and um, added the hen hunts and the permits and grouping it all together. And my question was, was it enough last year? <laughs> and and do you have a better answer now? It sounds like no, because it sounds like you're having to expand it. So can you talk about that a little bit? Chair Wall, Commissioner King. Um, yeah, happy to talk about that. We got good feedback from, from the district. And, and I think what the win is that the district spent much less time doing um, trapping and removal activities because of this permit. Um, this permit empowers landowners to utilize hunters to deal with the problem um, rather than tapping department resources to go in and, and trap these birds out. Um, two years ago when this came forward, um, there was nowhere to put the birds and we wound up euthanizing a lot of a lot of turkeys. They went to uh, food kitchens, but um, I mean, it was a lot of birds. And that's not really a desirable, um, that's not desirable from a hunter standpoint um, and, and certainly not desirable from a district, um, how we want district to, to spend their staff time. Um, and so, so that's the real win with this product. Um, we were able to, you know, to advise landowners that this is the way that we're dealing with with turkey issues. Now, um, if you can um, allow hunters to come in and at a, you know, and and it costs less for the hunters to participate. This is essentially a three for one product, uh, same cost as a turkey tag, um, and that and that was a barrier for folks to, um, if you if you shoot three turkeys, all of a sudden that's 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 uh, you know over seventy five dollars. And it does start to add up. Um, so uh, with this product, it's only um, the cost of one turkey tag, twenty six fifty. So um, I, I think for the most part, it it is a win. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time for the landowners to really get comfortable, um, you know, with with bringing in hunters that they're not familiar with. Right. So you think it's it, it, so? I guess we are making progress. And that, and also, you're saying we need to augment it. We need to expand it. 
essentially. That's correct. Um, we, we have a lot of interest from other districts um, that, again, do not have the resources to spend time trapping turkeys off of private lands. It, and it's just frankly not always that successful. And we don't really have good places to put them right now because of limitations with, um, with avian influenza. Um, we don't have a lot of support for moving birds all over the landscape right now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And my question for Brandon, and I know um, uh, Commissioner Laphart has some specific questions as well, so I won't touch on Harlequin. I'll let him ask those questions because we have chatted a bit. But um, my question is, and it's kind of more general, and and I, I'm not sure how to get there because we've talked about this many, many times, but I still I still don't get any kind of answer that makes any sense to me in that the bird season is the longest season by far, yet that's the one that's not changing ever. Whereas we're seeing fish seasons go all over the place. We're seeing um, big game having to shift either because of fire, because of drought, because of changing seasons. The bird season, every single year, it's almost turnkey. It's exactly the same, exactly the same numbers. We're not doing many changes, and I never understand why. Like, how are we not affected by the climate changes that's knocking everyone else around? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner King, um, I'm going to assume that, um, well, I guess I, I don't want to assume. So when you say bird season. Uh, sorry, um, the uh, the upland, I mean, I'm sorry, the waterfowl season, meaning um, whatever, the 107 days that we're allowed or sure. whatever it is. Sure. <laughs> so there, like, there is a robust data collection and analysis procedure in place that suggests at the current population levels, even though those le those populations fluctuate due to drought, you know, which is more of an acute thing for long-term shifts in, in the habitat, that at our current levels, the liberal seasons, the 107 days, seven bird bag limit for ducks, for example, are currently sustainable. Those adaptive harvest management protocols have in place um, levels at which the model would said would say, okay, now is the time where you need to restrict. And according to that procedure and those models, we are not yet there. At some point in the future, we certainly could get there. Um, and that would most likely be due to um, more intense drought, whether that was normal climatic variation or longer term shifts in the climate. Right, okay. So um, at least for now, because I can tell as someone that's out there, you know, we go from sweating to ice storms. I mean, it is just all over the place. And so at the end of the day, at the end of the season, yes, you get your numbers, but it, it, those numbers don't tell you about the chaos that's happening on the ground. So do you have any other measure of that chaos or is it just you just look at the end number? Um, uh, Commissioner King, um, I would say we look at the end number so much. We look at that beginning number okay. and that's the the population status that that we observe in the spring dictates the length of the season. We certainly know that success during those seasons and bird distribution are going to be um, greatly affected by how the weather plays out over the season. Um, for ducks, that is that is one thing. Hunters, of course, watch closely. Um, we, we know that if it's a, a, a drier fall, let's say that ducks are gonna be more concentrated and hunters may not have the opportunity they did before simply because the habitat conditions aren't there yet. Um, if those areas get wet and flooded during the winter, the ducks will respond to those areas and honors that not those areas, their success is going to improve. And then of course, um, if we see <clears throat> cold frozen conditions, you know, that does that <clears throat> tends to, you know, move birds around, maybe lessens uh, um, some people's success and increases others. Right. Okay. And and just my last question, because I know Commissioner Labhart has his question about the Harlequins, but um, my last question is, how are we comparing it nationally? Because I know some of the other flyways have had some real kind of epic collapses. They're really kind of struggling. And do we have any of that happening? And, you know, and I'm thinking also like bits of our flyways, like what's happening, say, in the Klamath and kind of the collapse that's happening. Well, issues that's happened there because of like lack of water and so many other things happening in the Klamath. So do we, are we kind of watching that globally and how we're comparing to other things? Yes, uh, Commissioner King. Um, yeah, so there, the, the prairies in general have been 
the heart of the breeding waterfowl on this continent is, is the is the prairies of the U.S. and Canada. Right. Um, they have been getting a little bit drier, and we have seen waterfowl populations respond. Um, they have been declining for the last several years, still at a very abundant level, though. Um, we notice that in our harvest. We aren't as greatly affected by prairie numbers as, say, um, the central or Mississippi flyways. But we get a lot of birds from Alberta, and Alberta, Alberta has been in the grips of a long-term drought and drying. Um, but again, still, waterfowl are still abundant and still at levels, which is, would support the harvest that we're proposing. Um, locally, we have we have seen some drought. Thankfully, as Michael, Michael showed, the last two years, we have seen very good conditions. Um, and then due to some of the changes that have gone on right now in Klamath, the uh, refuges on the California side are actually abundantly full, which is which is great to see. Um, that all has to do with you know the precipitation we've had, as well as the dam removal projects that have been going on, and they need places to put water, and the refuges are great places to put water, and so that's great to see. And so we are seeing a rebound from the 2020 to 2022 um, droughts that we experienced, and and that is good here on the local level. Okay. Thank you. And like I said, I know Commissioner Labhart has questions, and I may have others depending on what he asks. Let's Thank go you. to Commissioner Labhart. Thank you, Dr. King. Go to Commissioner Labhart, and then we do have two people who would like to testify for um, from the public. So, mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Labhart, your question about Harlan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll wait uh, for my comments after public comment, if that's okay. Okay, thank you. Then you'll stay close. But um, the two people for public testimony, Tyler Dungannon and Tristan Tristan um, Henry. So if you two will come up and you'll each have three minutes and if you'll introduce yourselves. And if the red light's on, the microphone's on. Thank you, Chair Wall, uh, Commissioners and Acting Director Paul Mary. My name is Tyler Dungan, and I'm the Conservation Coordinator for Oregon Hunters Association. Um, first, I want to say that OHA is supportive of all the staff proposals you just heard. Uh, we appreciate that Brandon and Michael and Game Bird staff are carefully managing our game birds and also maximizing hunting opportunity where possible. Uh, specifically with regard to wild turkey, uh, we encourage ODFW staff to continue monitoring our wild turkey populations. It was really easy for us to put the stamp of approval on our uh, changes to the beardless turkey permit this year because of figures provided by Michael last year. We were able to see populations before and after the change, and we decided this looks good to us, and we very much appreciate that and hope that continues in the future. Um, with regard to sage grouse, um, I think Michael downplayed how big of a deal it is that our production, our chicks per hen, last year was the highest it's been in 40 years. So hopefully right now those those juveniles that were juveniles last year are showing up on the Lex. Um, we really are encouraged by that, and we're very excited that it was hunter harvested wings that showed us that information. Um, very important. There are many factors driving sage grouse population decline. Hunting, as conservative as it is, does not contribute to any decline in Oregon. Um, for this reason and many more, we support continued harvest of sage grouse. Uh, so now I'm going to move to a bird that wasn't talked about today. It's native to Oregon. It's the Colombian sharp-tailed grouse. I hope everybody knows what a Colombian sharp-tailed grouse is. If you don't, please go Google it. They are, they, their displays rival sage grouse, put it that way. Um, they're a lecking bird, just like sage grouse. But many don't, many don't know this bird is native to Oregon. And before the 60s and 70s, um, they occurred in, in most, if not every county in eastern Oregon. Um, ODFW, um, after the extirpation of the species in 1960s and 70s, ODFW implemented an extensive effort to try to reestablish the species. They are an Oregon conservation strategy species too. Maybe that's where you've heard of them. Um, but that, uh, you know, it seemed like that effort that went on for 20 years, multiple hundred birds just kind of fizzled out. And it, we're looking at maybe a handful of birds out there currently. We don't even have a lot of hard evidence that they still occur out there. Um, some folks, you know, eyesight accounts, things like that. Um, but I'm coming to you to say that we shouldn't give up. 
we shouldn't give up on our efforts to to restore the species as as sportsmen and as oha we ha- we feel a duty to try to restore the species and it's a bit like pushing a big boulder up a hill to get this done it can be a daunting task for odfw staff to to try to move birds from other states or even other provinces but we are here today to try to start the conversation about how we might be talking with our experts um, plenty of sharp tail grouse experts out there across the western united states and there's plenty of of uh, Michael's counterparts, for instance, in other states that um, would like to help us. I know Nevada is uh, translocating about 20 birds, um, you know, from Idaho in the next three years. I think we should start asking those questions about where where the quality habitat is and where we can, can best try to move this thing forward. So with that, I will uh, end my comments here and I can answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. We'll go to you then, Tristan. Thank you, Commissioner Wall. Um, uh, sorry, Chair Wall, uh, Co-Chair Hatfield Hyde, um, Director Paul Mary, and uh, members of the Commission. Um, my name, for the record, is Tristan Henry. I am the Oregon Field Representative for the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. We're a national nonprofit with 63 partner organizations and 143, uh, 140,000 supporting members nationwide. Uh, and I just wanted to take uh, time this morning to uh, um, comment on my support for uh, the staff's recommendations on the game bird um, proposals uh, and and express our gratitude for all the hard work that um, goes into producing those recommendations. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to um, Acknowledge the uh, success in the sporting and and the uh, appreciation the sporting community on the part of the Grant County um, Beerless Turkey Program. Um, I think that's a wonderful way of dealing with um, and reduce, <clears throat> excuse me, reducing uh, human wildlife conflict. And I would also like to um, to to mention our support for uh, the. The continued monitoring and and participation um, in in sage grouse numbers and and um, as Tyler mentioned um, our our intent yeah. to support um, the restoration of tailed grouse in Northeast Oregon. I apologize, I did not prepare comments. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm not sure what the interference is. Questions, commissioners, of these two. All right. Thank you. Um, and we'll go back then to Commissioner Labhart and your question, and then, and thank you, staff, for coming back up. Okay, thank you, Chair Wall. Uh, mostly, I have uh, comments, and then I have uh, potentially two uh, motions that I hope I can talk the commission into uh, supporting one or the other one. Uh, I got my first shotgun when I was uh, 12 years old by my grandfather, and have been an avid upland game and duck hunter for all those years since then, but I still have that shotgun. So I just wanted to let people know that, that I'm a pretty adamant hunter of uh, both upland and waterfowl. So I asked Brandon the following questions and appreciate very much, Brandon, uh, your detailed responses to each of my questions. In the interest of time, I will just list my questions before I get to my summary thoughts. Um, my questions were, first one, one of the latest OVFNW inventories on harlequin species, and please explain why the department listed this species of duck as an Oregon conservation sensitive species. Second question, what is the harvest of harlequins and has ODFNW attempted to determine where these birds have been harvested? Third question, if harvest rates are low, as I suspect they are, what implica- implications will there be to eliminate or reduce harlequin harvest from a current seven person per bag limit uh, on either statewide or regional, seven birds per person on a statewide or regional basis for a few years to see if it has any positive implications on this low number sensitive species population. And then I said, uh, ran in a question a couple weeks ago. I said, without any information to refute, because I've yet to read the entire staff report in detail, why would the commission continue to allow hunting at this level of seven birds per day of a sensitive conservation species, either inside or outside coastal estuaries, 
my last question was, how do we biologically support a bag limit of seven birds per day for an entire species of a species that is listed, again, as a conservation species with such low numbers? And so Brandon, Brandon did a good job of answering those questions. So now my summary. Um, the Department of State's Oregon Harlequins are associated with the northern population from Washington State, British Columbia, Alberta, and beyond. How do we know this when there is little to no data? Then there are statements that the wintering and non-breeding summer population of Oregon's birds are distributed throughout the Oregon coast in the wintertime. But then comes the statement, quote, the harlequins are birds from throughout the southern breeding range, unquote. How do we know where the southern breeding range is located? Where do all these conclusions come from when there has not been a range-wide coastal survey or a more specific study to tease out where Oregon's birds go in the winter? The Oregon Conservation Strategy only suggests more data is needed for these coastal populations. The Oregon Conservation Strategy does not identify any actions for the Oregon Cascades breeding population of harlequins. When the only data exists on the species, which indicated declining populations from the early 1990s to 2012. So looking back in time, once harlequins were identified as a conservation sensitive species of concern, my opinion was bag limits should have been adjusted by the commission back then, and we did not. I believe Commissioner King may have proposed that we look at it back then, uh, but we didn't, didn't take any action. And so obviously, uh, this should be re reviewed when we currently update the Oregon Conservation Strategy. So the Oregon Conservation Strategy concluded harlequins need to become a strategy species. Why is it that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regulation allows seven birds a day all season long? The U.S. Uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service sets maximum bag limits for states based on status and trends of species populations, harvest, and associated habitat as, and not geographic availability to hunters. I can only guess the service includes high bag limits for harlequins in Oregon, since there's no record of harvest of birds are available along the Oregon coast in large enough numbers for the hunting season, and no refuting data to state otherwise. And the staff comments that I got, um, some staff comments, the only sure way to reduce the harvest or prevent an increase in harvest is to close harvest. While staff has some concern about how this would affect novice waterfowl hunters with weaker identification skills, we think this could be mitigated by prohibiting harvest west of Highway 101. Now, this is staff's comments back to me. Uh, this would, for all practical purpose, protect all harlequin in Oregon from for the waterfowl season, while also giving assurance to novice waterfowl hunters in the vast majority of the state that they don't need to worry about misidentifying a harlequin. If the desire is to reduce reduce harvest or ensure harvest doesn't increase, the staff recommendation would be a coastal harvest closure over the reduction bag limit. So in summary, uh, possible options for my fellow commissioners to consider. Uh, one is to reduce two or eliminate the daily, uh, limit, uh, daily limit of harvest of harlequins west of Highway 101. It addresses the desire to limit the harvest of this conservation species until we know that the numbers have rebounded or we have verifiable inventory numbers of this conservation species. So I have uh, two motions that staff has prepared uh, for discussion. And I'm, I'm not gonna move them now, I'll just read them into the record here and then we can have a discussion if, if there is a consensus to move forward for one or more of these motions. And it does address the uh, changes that we talked about uh, that staff brought up with the Falcon uh, issue, the recent changes this morning. Mm -hmm. It would be to amend OAR 635 and the divisions and adopt staff proposals as shown in attachment three, including the changes shown in attachment one, except on page 30 of attachment three, amend the daily limits to prohibit the take of Harlequin ducks west of Highway 101. That's one proposal. The second one is essentially the same thing, but it would amend the daily bag limit to no more than one harlequin. In other words, if some of the commissioners say, well, I'm not really too hot on eliminating the entire harvest of harlequin, but maybe we could reduce it down to one uh, to see if we could uh, have uh, addressing some of this issue. So that's my proposal. So I'd be glad to have a discussion. on this. My first question would be if 
some I heard some of that. I understand the last two the two um, potential motions that he mentioned, but I don't I sure didn't hear all of that clearly. Can somebody summarize that in a couple sentences? Uh, yes, Chair. Well, I'll you know, try my try my best. Um, so, Commissioner Labhart um, uh, is right now in the bag limit. Harlequins are not mentioned, just like green wing teal or widgeon. They're ducks, so they can be taken at the bag limit of seven per day um, per hunter. Um, Commissioner Labhart is, I believe. Um, Making a motion um, or putting a motion on the on the table to um, restrict that to one Harlequin per day in the coastal area west of 101, or close completely for Harlequins west of 101. Thank you. That helps, Commissioner King. Oh, you were first, Vice okay. Chair. Go ahead. Yes. Um. So. Oh, jeez. Darn it. Um, so um, maybe this is for Michael. I don't know which one of you this question is for, but I um, have a couple questions. One is, did you not say, at, or did you guys say at the beginning of this presentation that we will be doing a hard deep dive into looking at all of these regulations next year on all of this? Uh, Chair Wall, Commis um, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde, um, the Upland framework is uh, is the five year is the five year plan, and so um, yeah, specific to Upland game birds, we'll be looking at season length and bag limit um, for each individual species. We'll be doing the deep dive um, in 2025 and doing a significant um, public outreach on that front, but only for Upland. Yeah, yeah. So not for any of the ducks you're not Correct. doing any of the ducks okay that's important information um so in terms of um i guess what i'm trying to get at is i i normally do not like making uh decisions on one duck amongst a variety of ducks unless we're kind of reviewing the whole thing and we give the public an opportunity to review what's going on there so I guess, you know, on the fly, I'm trying to understand the status of Harlequin ducks and that feels like a lot to try to figure out here right at, at this moment, just to know, to make a decision. I'd rather have time, but what is your opinion and what do you know about what's going on with them? <laughs> Uh, Sorry. Chair Wall, Commissioner Hyde, I, I will be as you I will be as brief as I can because this ask the question. this would be a, a very large presentation. Um, <laughs> Harlequin ducks breed and winter in the state. We have breeding birds in the Cascades. Harlequin ducks are different than most other species. These birds breed in fast-flowing streams mm -hmm. um, during the winter. Well, it, for the rest of their lives, they are on salt associated with near shore rocky habitats um, the males essentially only go to the breeding streams from about now until june when the females incubating and then they're back to the ocean the females in those broods spend their time on the salt our birds in oregon and i i have to apologize to mark i may have misstated in my responses oregon's harlequins are associated with the western harlequin population alaska to california and everything but Alaska is composed of the southern segment, or referred to as the southern segment. Alaska birds are kind of their own. They're, the, they're quite abundant up there. Everything else, the main wintering area is Puget Sound and uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuaca up there in, in British Columbia. We do, though, have harlequins wintering on Oregon's coast. We have some limited banding evidence of harlequins breeding in Oregon. Those birds only recently, they're marked with leg bands that you could read when they're standing on rocks. The only sightings of our breeding birds occurred wintering in Washington, but yet we still have birds wintering on our coast. Those could be some of our birds, but there are certainly other birds coming from the Northern Rocky Mountain states. So that's kind of the nutshell of Harlequins. They are nowhere in Oregon an abundant species. 
However, they do breed on our scattered streams and winter in appropriate habitat on the coast. Um, harvest is extremely low. The federal surveys have never documented harlequins in Oregon's duck harvest. And last year with the a little bit of renewed interest in harlequins, we implemented um, a special sea duck survey for our sea duck hunters. 2022's harvest estimate was 23. This year's harvest estimate was nine. Um, and that's again with the overall bag limit being seven per day per hunter. Um, and so um, that's kind of where we're at. We, we do not have a standard breeding population survey for these birds. Surveying those streams is incredibly difficult to do. They're on streams. You would have to, if you want to survey breeding pairs, you're doing it now when high winter flows. It's impractical to do it all the time without extreme cost. And then on the wintering side of things, they're standing on rocks along the coast. You could fly an airplane over them. You'd be doing extremely low altitude flights, looking for a bird that matches a rock in the winter time. So um, I could probably go on and on, but I know we're short on time. Yeah, and I guess I'm just my my comment is 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 also is there a a, you know, short of, and I have so much respect for Commissioner Labhart, so I wish he was here so I could look at him and be like, hey, I respect you and what you're trying to say here, but I don't really like us going out of process and just making a decision for one bird without a process that comes before us where we make a decision, because I think that's just, that's why we have a thousand scientists in ODF and W, right, to help us move through this and take public comment from a variety of viewpoints. So that's what I'll say. Thank you, Commissioner King. Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, so my issue, and I brought it up, and that's why we had the Sea Duck Survey, is because, and maybe this is somewhat of what uh, my fellow commissioner is touching on, because harlequins are so rare and they're prized. Um, and Washington changed its regs. And that made a Washington guide come down here and it, think literally here, somewhere in the Tillamook area, take out seven of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so that's what launched all this stuff last year. And we'd started the survey and I said, what are we gonna do if this ever happens again? Like, do we have a plan? We ca this cannot continue, et cetera. And now I've gotten no record that it, that it did happen again. But the the point being is that they are so rare, and the way the regs are, are written, there was nothing you could do from preventing someone to coming and doing that again. And so I think that's part of what's happening. But I I I think we need to like work that out and, and like get something specific, um, because uh, all we did last year, what and what all we could do was oh let's do the survey, let's figure out what's going on, let's figure out how many are harvested, etc. But that didn't get us further along into like the, some of the processes that um, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde is talking about. So, um, and if this is a conservation species, you know, you got to wonder why are we hunting it at all? Like, I mean, this 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 brings up a whole different kettle of fish. Um, and the question is, I guess this didn't the the whole people coming from another state didn't happen again, from what I can we can tell from the survey. Um, do we have anything that? would prevent it? Do we have any resolution? Or are we exactly in the same spot? We just have a survey. Like, what do we do or achieve? Uh, Chair Wall, Commissioner King. Um, so yes, no no changes to the season structure were made. So um, people could attempt to pursue harlequins and and take, you know, them with, within the bag limit. In the past, the department has as part of a flyway overall flyway review of Harlequin bag limits that was requested by the Fish and Wildlife Service, taking a look at our habitats. Most of the Harlequin wintering habitat in Oregon cannot legally be hunted or is impossible to hunt, almost nearly impossible. So there are only a small handful of areas where Harlequin occur where hunters can also occur. So most of the wintering population by default is unavailable to harvest. And so that is kind of our, our limiting factor. And then 
you're right. As far as as far as we know, there was no um, um, situation where guides were taking clients out for Harlequin in Oregon. Um, like I said, the harvest estimate this past year was nine birds, um, and that's based on the, the survey that 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 we sent out. So. Right. So I guess I understand what you're saying. Like, it's almost like, look, you can't hunt them. So it doesn't matter the number because you can't reach them. You can't get them. And then someone came, like I said, somewhere around here, I think Tillamook area came and just nailed a bunch of them. So I guess my, the only thing I would ask is like, how do we prevent a repeat of that? We've done nothing that would repeat, that would prevent the repeat of that. So and I think that's where we're coming up with, do we need limits? Do we need to be in line with Washington? Because that's what spurred the person coming over the line, because Washington changed their limit, and therefore they came here. So, I mean, how do we come to some sort of, I don't know, uh, it's almost like the Columbia. Like, 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 how do we come to alignment over the two so that people can't just cross the state line and, and just, you know, do whatever? Is there a way? Um, uh, Commissioner King... I would I would say that if the commission is concerned about um, hunters or guides taking uh, multiple harlequins, so that the situation that occurred that kind of brought this up was um, a, a Washington guide with I believe five clients, so six six people total, and and I think the harvest was ten between those six. Um, if 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 that is uh, something that is is not desirable. The only way to pre prevent it would be to either lower the bag limit or close the season. If if I may, Chair Wall, Commissioner King, I will say in your question of how do we prevent this from occurring, um, we have already made some changes in that survey such that if we do get a year, we do get a record of this high harvest or this high interest, we have the ability through this April rulemaking process to then make those changes. So, for example, if we did start to see an increasing harvest, or we started to see this exploitation that brought concern to staff, to our public, and to our commission, we could be making that proposal, we could be making that change right now. But through that survey in itself, it provided that feedback that that type of an action may not be necessary based on the harvest information. Now, still just having your own concerns and fears about regulations and what ifs, that, that's still a fair conversation. But but we have had that that uh, survey get put into place, which provides that information, that feedback to us of, is this something that we need to take action on and potentially propose a change? Okay. Let me, and we need to be fairly quick. Go ahead, Commissioner Spellbrink, and then I have, a, I think, a proposal. Yeah, thank you, Chair Wall. I, I mean, I was just gonna suggest the second proposal that Commissioner Labhart made of, uh, I think it was a limit of one, that would still, you know, I guess it would leave access. Someone accidentally shooting one thinking the season was open, it would cover that. It sounded like that would, you know, that would cover the problem. And it bring us in line with Washington. It what? It would bring us in line with Washington. Um, can we hold the motion for just a minute? I think that's a, a great proposal, but I'd like to ask one other question on something different, and then we can come right back to it, and then we can finish this one, I think. Mike, it, it's... It, my question is about sage grouse, and I think it's, you know, it's the rare good news that things are better this year than they have been for a long time. And I don't, I don't take that lightly. I think it's terrific. It's, it's doubly good news that we might have new LEX with the new surveys. We have the new maps. We have some information. So I'm not going to suggest this right now, this year, that we change the, the harvest. I do have some deep concern about the the trend line continues steeply down with sage grouse. We have, you know, this has been here for a long time and the trend line has not changed. It's still heading in the wrong direction. You mentioned that we may be able to, we will look at this with the, when the new let counts come out and we will have some more information. So rather than make a motion now to change sage grouse, because I don't, because we do have some good news and we might have more leks. I do request that we look at that with temporary rules as soon as we can, if we if we have any indication, because that's serious. I mean, those are the kinds of things we're supposed to be looking at in advance and saying this trend line is is in the wrong direction. Let's do something. So I will be looking for that in temporary rule. And I'll stop there just for 
for time, and maybe we can go back to this motion, staff. Oh, okay. We have Commissioner Labhart, very quickly, do you have one more comment? And then we're going to go ahead with a motion. Okay. Uh, well, and the comment is, is we're only once a year do we make a decision on numbers of both upland birds and ducks. So if, if we postpone this, we'll postpone it for another year. So I'm just saying, uh, try to pass the red faced test here, which is, uh, you know, I can see the headline now. Uh, ODFMW identifies a species as a critical sensitive species, but allows the maximum harvest to occur. And our answer to that is, well, they don't, we don't think they shoot too many of those. So that's my point is, if, if we want to keep the harvest low, let, let's just address it to, and, and address it as a conservation species and get ahead of it rather than just saying, well, we don't think they're going to harvest very many of them. So I guess that's why I'm, I'm ready to make a motion to see if there's any traction to it at all. So, if one possible. More. One more comment. Thank you, Commissioner Lapart. Go ahead. Just one more question, Derek, because I think you were trying to say this. Do we do we have a process in place where we can bring this up ahead of right now to make decisions like this? Like, is there some like is there is this the only way you can make decisions like on how to harvest? What would be a a because uh, um, in you know this is a this is a horrible example, right? Because this is an incredible duck. It's being exploited by what's happening in Washington. It's beautiful. It, like Commissioner Labhart says, it'll be headlines, whatever. What is a better process that we could use ahead of time of this decision making so that people can weigh in on both sides and we have you bring us a proposal instead of us making it up right now? Chair Wall, uh, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde. Um, we work for the director and for the commission. So uh, if Director Paul Mary could provide direction or chair could say, staff, please come back at a later date and, and discuss this topic. As Brandon mentioned, he could have a full day's presentation on Harlequin conservation and management and get into the harvest stats, et cetera, et cetera. So if there was something in the interim outside of this normal August process, um, we would abide by that direction. Commissioner Labhart. I thought he was trying to. Uh, ready for a motion? Yes, Sorry. it's hard to hear, I have to admit. Go ahead. Hmm? Okay, um, I, move, I move to amend OAR chapter 635 division in 51, 52, 53, 54, 60 and 95 as proposed by staff in attachment four and adopt staff proposals as shown in attachment three, including the changes shown in addendum one, except on page 30 of attachment three and amend the daily bag limit to no more than one Harlequin duck. Second. It's been moved and seconded as was just read into the record by Commissioner Labhart. Um, and I'm not gonna try to repeat it. I, it was basically, what we have on our motion list, the change in in attachment three and that the Harlequin limit be reduced to one. Was there a spatial reference to that? Would it just be a statewide limitation to one or right. a reference to a Highway 101? It was, there was, should have been reference to Highway. I'm sure you expected reference to Highway 101 in that, right? Commissioner yes. Labhart. I just read the motion that staff gave me. So if staff wants to change it, it can be. Let's get this one straight because staff did have one that included the geographic um, area, which was Highway 101 West. So go ahead, Brian. Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, for the record, Brian Wolfer, Wildlife Division, Deputy Administrator. So yeah, um, when Commissioner Labhart indicated he he was considering making some motions around Harlequin, we provided some some ways to to do that. Um, and with the bag limit reduction option, 
uh, that would be a statewide bag limit reduction option is is what I had provided to him. And if um, the desire was for a closure, um, really targeting that closure west of 101 where Harlequins occur, so we don't have that confusion with novice duck hunters throughout the state that are concerned about their ability to identify a Harlequin, even though they won't encounter one in other places. Um, I do want to make it clear because I'm not sure from listening in the back that it was real clear. One of for staff, we're not sure what increased effort could result in for harvest. And so um, we saw last year um, some increases in, har well, in 2022, we saw some higher harvest than in 2023, um, likely due to some increased effort with um, some guiding from uh, some Washington guides. And so most of our Harlequin are not in a position where they're gonna be harvested, um, but we do wanna be clear that when it comes to a bag limit reduction, there is the potential that that will draw attention to the species. Um, and people will increase some harvest effort. And so from a staff standpoint, um, we just want to be make sure the commission understands that if the intent is to reduce harvest, um, that may only be accomplished with a with a closure for harvest. Um, a reduced bag limit may actually increase um, attention and effort, and that could result in increased harvest. And so um, with that, I'll let you discuss the motion. And the west of Highway 101, you had, as you described it, was if there was a closure. Correct. And and a bag limit of one. Um, Would be so why? Yeah, the 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 likelihood of encountering encountering a Harlequin east of 101 is very very unlikely. Um, and so, if, with a bag limit of one, if someone did harvest one east of 101. Um, they wouldn't be able to harvest a second and they wouldn't likely encounter a second. So, um, but with the closure, it was really around giving assurance to novice duck hunters that they don't have to be an expert on Harlequin ID um, in most of the state. We might. Let me just, on the, can I keep that? Yeah, thanks. The, on the motion, um, Commissioner Spellbrink, you seconded it. Yes. Can you describe where we are right now in terms of what motion you think is on the table so we can? It would be a limit of one statewide. One Harlequin duck statewide. Okay. I'm sure, please. I'm curious about this unintended consequence yeah. situation. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about the evidence to support uh, that hypothesis. Chair, Chair Wall, Commissioner Khalil. Um, right now, the word Harlequin occurs in the game bird regulations only in the definition of sea ducks. Most hunters in Oregon, most duck hunters, many of many, not see as many, are likely unaware that Harlequins are even accessible in the state, that they can get one. Our fear is that if we say the bag limit of Harlequins is one per day or one per season even, that suddenly people will go, where can I get my Oregon Harlequin? I want to go get an Oregon yes. Harlequin. And we may see an increase in harvest. It's speculation, but if the intent is to be conservative and reduce harvest from current levels. We think the only way to do that would be a closure. The only way to assure it would be a closure. Commissioner Hatfield Hyde and then Commissioner Spellbrink. So, and I recognize that we have a long, long day, so, but is it possible for us to direct staff to bring this back to us in the June meeting with a proposal for what to do here so that we can weigh in and potentially, you know, have the option of completely closing this or harvesting one, give people an opportunity to weigh in rather than making a decision today. Is that a is that a bad idea? It would have to be August, I believe, just given what's on the June meeting. And and Chair Wall, yes. um, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, that 
the the regulations for game bird hunting will be printed before then and so while we can do temporary rules um temporary rules uh are not as effective as actually getting the correct information in front of people um in that printed document um just one second commissioner spellbrink did you have another option to no just the fact that uh it sounds like the majority of the population isn't even accessible so I don't see that being a problem as far as increasing the bag limit too much, you know, too high. Uh, just the overall, I mean, the, I guess the overall uh, harvest being, ex, you know, exceeding a certain number just because, the, I mean, from the uh, presentation, the, the majority of the population isn't even accessible. So are you that. saying that in support of, of a yeah. bag limit of one? A bag limit still. of one, yes. Okay. Are you okay with having the vote right now anyway? Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway. then we have a motion on the table that is, I'm gonna skip the rest of it, but it is a bag limit of one statewide. Legal counsel, any reason that, is that enough to move forward right now? Um, yes, because. Uh, we can move forward right now because Commissioner Labhart read the, the, read the language. Motion, it. So that's the motion that's on the table. Moved and seconded, as you have heard, at great lengths, and <laughs> it's one statewide. So I would like, uh, will you call the roll, Michelle, on this one? King? No. Spring Spellbrink? Yes. Labhart? Yes. Khalil? No. Hatfield Hyde? Yes. Wall. Yes. I believe it's four three or two or two. <laughs> that motion passes. Thank you. And we will hear more from you about the sage grouse later and about this one, I bet. So thank you. No, each yeah. yeah. I'll come back to that. We're going to move just in the interest of time. We're going to ask the people who are doing Exhibit C, Private Forest Accord grant program, to come forward and do both it and, um, if we can, exec uh, Exhibit D at sort of the same time. So will those staff come forward, Sarah and your staff? Oh, okay. Just see. Okay. But we'll do C and then you eat lunch and maybe we'll be here. That sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Chair Wall, uh, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, members of the Commission, uh, Interim okay. Director Paul Mary, Sarah Reif again, Habitat Division Administrator. Um, I'm just going to provide a little bit of background here and then. Um, introduce my uh, colleagues. Uh, so this this agenda item is about the Private Forest Accord and the grant program and the first round of um, grants that have been uh, recommended to you for approval. And so just, I, I know many of you know this, but um, for the public's interest as well, the Private Forest Accord was a compromise agreement made in 2021 between representatives from Oregon's timber industry, the Small Woodlands Association and prominent conservation and fishing organizations to modify portions of Oregon's forest practices laws and regulations in a way that in a way that expands protections for fish and amphibians, while also providing regulatory certainty for timber harvest and forest management. The Private Forest Accord legislation was then passed in 2022, setting new standards. Uh, for forest roads and culverts to remove barriers to fish passage, expanding the width of required no-cut buffers along streams uh, to help keep water cold and clean, among other regulatory changes aimed to enhance protections for aquatic habitat. The Oregon Department of Forestry is the lead agency on implementation of these new standards and is the lead in development of the Private Forest Accord Habitat Conservation Plan which would form the basis of a federally issued incidental take permit to cover any potential impacts of forest practices to federally listed species and a handful of species of concern. The PFA legislation also created a mitigation fund as a sub-account of the OCRF 
designed to support aquatic habitat restoration projects as conservation measures in the pending habitat conservation plan. The legislation called for establishment of a grant program administered by ODFW with projects reviewed and recommended by the Private Forest Accord Grant Program Advisory Committee and ultimately approved by you, the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission. We're very excited today to be bringing you the first round of projects from the grant program for your approval. This is a significant milestone for the grant program and marks the culmination of a year's worth of work by Andy Spurka, our grant program coordinator, and our very dedicated volunteers and agency advisors working on the advisory committee. Uh, before Andy gets into the staff presentation, I'd like to introduce the co-chairs of the advisory committee. We have Chad Washington with us in the room and we have Kristen Rivard with us online. And they would like to just say a few words to mark this really important milestone um, on the first round of our grant awards. Chad. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, as Sarah said, I'm here to voice support for the projects proposed to you today on behalf of the Mitigation Advisory Committee. I would like to highlight the collaborative nature of the committee and am encouraged to see that we continue to focus on the benefit to the covered species under the HCP. Uh, the inaugural application cycle had over 70 applications that we were able to narrow down to the top 26. The projects before you today represent our top priorities and reflect the grant criteria as established. You will see that these projects represent the diversity in geography, type of organization that was funded, and project type. I would like to take the time to thank the PFA biologists that helped review all of these grants, as well as ODFW staff, ODF staff, members of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, and NOAA. Um, yeah, that's all that I have to say. That thanks everybody for their time on this, and uh, thank you for considering the slate of projects in front of you today. Thank you for your work on this. Thanks, Chad. Kristen, we'll go to you online. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield Hyde, Acting Director Palmieri, and members of the Commission. My name is Kristen Rivard. I'm the Oregon Director for Trout Unlimited. TU is a signatory to the Private Forest Accord and was one of the core negotiating organizations throughout the process. The mitigation fund is critical to the success of the Private Forest Accords, and I am very appreciative of the incredible effort that the commission went to, and most particularly the staff at ODFW to launch this program in such a short amount of time and so successfully. I am very pleased to report that the entire grant solicitation and review process was public facing, transparent, and ultimately the members of the committee reached full consensus in recommending this slate of projects for you. I think that really demonstrates um, the level of collaboration and the importance of uh, both the timber industry and conservation community working collaboratively in this program. Um, particular uh, appreciation to Sarah Reif and Andy Spurka, um, who put countless hours into this effort. And as Chad said, a huge thanks to all of the state and federal employees and technical experts that provided input into the process. Thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to the ongoing success of this program. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is that the slide advance? Uh, thank you. It's okay. tricky. It's all right. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Chair Wall, Vice Chair Hatfield High, and Acting Director Plumera, and members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Andy Sferker. I'm the Private Forest Record Grant Coordinator. And today I'm going to spend a few minutes briefly discussing the suite of 25 projects that we are recommending for funding for the inaugural solicitation for the Private Forest Record Grant Program. So the PFA grant program aims to create a positive and direct impact on the Private Forest Accord Habitat Conservation Plan covered fish and wildlife species and their habitats across the state. Proposals focused on the most critical needs for covered species, directly addressing priorities from recovery plans and factors limiting species health. The program is designed to be flexible and meet applicants where they are. We welcome proposals from a wide range of projects from planning to implementation and encourage innovative approaches to make a real difference for the species. And with our ask, applicants delivered. With an overwhelming response, 
over 74 proposals submitted from throughout the state, totaling over $43 million in requested funding. This demonstrated both the need for the program and the passion for watershed health across the state. Proposals ranged from implementation to research showcasing a variety of approaches. Applicants offered millions of dollars in matching funds with an average request of $500,000, highlighting the project depth and the commitment by these organizations. The program has the potential to create significant positive change across Oregon. And of course, we plan on building on this momentum with our next solicitation later this fall. We narrowed down $43 million in requests to a $10 million budget, thanks to the interagency collaboration, expert staff, and of course, the assistance of our Private Voice Accord Advisory Committee. The 25 shortlisted projects prioritize positive impact on the Private Forest Accord Habitat Conservation Plan covered species and their habitats. These projects offer significant benefits and hold the potential to make a real difference in conservation. They represent a variety of project types and applicants, all demonstrating strong commitments with over $10 million in matching funds. With that, uh, we conclude our presentation to the Commission on the Private Forest Accord Grant Program funding request. Staff's recommendation is that the Commission approve this funding request. A draft motion has been provided here for your convenience, subject to any revisions that you may have. At this time, we're happy to try and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Commissioner's immediate questions. Thank Ms. you. King. Thank you, Chairwell, and thank you for your presentation, and thank you uh, to all of the advisory board, all you folks for your hard work to, that you did really fast. Um, <laughs> I um I just need to tell you I fully support this, but I have to, I just tell you in advance I have to abstain. I can't vote because I have a conflict. <laughs> so like when you when that comes up and then you see that I can't vote, it's not because I have some issue. I just want that known for the record, okay? Because um, I do I think this is amazing. But my question is actually, um, who qualifies for this? Meaning you have to be a landowner. What what exactly what are your criteria? Because I was trying to look at like I I actually read through. Um, like, you know, I guess to however many people applied versus who you granted it to. So how can you give me a little bit of your criteria of what, how this works? Uh, Chair Rawl, uh, Commissioner King, thank you for that question. Um, so any organization in the state can apply, um, nonprofit, private, uh, state agency, federal agency, landowners are can't apply on their own, a private landowner, but they're encouraged to apply with an eligible applicant like a watershed council or a conservation district of sorts, a resource conservation district. And tribal organizations, of course, are eligible okay. to apply too. Okay, so, uh, but the key is you have to be a landowner to apply or no? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. But the project, you you have to just partner with one of those eligible ones, but the private landowner is the one who can't apply on their own. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And also, like we you talk about the geographic yeah. diversity, because I was looking at it all, and I looked at Portland Metro. I think we only got three out of twenty-six. You know, and and is it because of the way the land works? There wasn't a lot within the watersheds or within the private land ownership that you couldn't get more. I'm just wondering how that came to be. Um, thank you, Commissioner King. So yeah, we're definitely aware of that, and we're looking to engage better next year on the Willamette Valley. Um, it highlighted some needs to be able to better connect there. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. Like it's just 50% of the population, but only 11% of the gifts. And I was thinking, was there a disconnect? And that's what I'm getting at. I, I think people don't understand. Like, do you have to have land to apply? I think there was some messaging that just didn't get reached because I, I think if I'm confused, I'm sure some other people are. <laughs> yes, please. If I may. Uh, Commissioner King, I think uh, it's also spurred by where these species we intend to benefit occur. Okay. And so you do see some kind of congregation of these projects uh, where those species are occurring or could potentially occur through rehabilitation efforts. Okay. But I will also mention when I sat in front of this commission with Bob Van Dyke last year, I heard you specifically say that you wanted to see equity in the process. And so we have worked very hard to incorporate that geographically yes. in the type of organizations that were funded and also the project types. Uh, so no, your, no, your I, comment was was heard and well received. No, I did notice that. And I, I do remember meeting you um, and we met at another uh, event. No, but I, def I definitely remember that. And I, I was very actually heartened to see that the wirehouses of the world weren't the people you picked. <laughs> so, uh, so um, I did notice, I did notice, um, and thank you. 
And um, yeah, I just think it, there's still a bit of a disconnect. I think people are still, and I realize it's new. I think people are just confused. They just don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things we've talked about, and specifically the Portland metro area projects that we did choose to fund, is that by funding them in that area, hopefully we can increase the visibility to the program itself. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully it will generate more projects as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. I have one question and then I think we're ready for a motion. Um, and thank you for this and for the fact that it's back and it it's, looks like it does. Um, one of the thing, conversations that came up in the, in the run up to all of this work was this was where we were looking for some of our beaver modified habitat funding. And could somebody just speak to how that shows up in these? And, and I know they're not listed as beaver modified habitat, but I bet there's something in there. So could you just mention something about it and then we'll go to a motion? Of course. Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, so yeah, we actually have three projects um, that I can highlight that talks that um, provide benefits for beavers. So we have the Upper Sign Creek Fist Passage Project, which is building bridges and reducing barriers by replacing culverts uh, with wildlife crossings. We have the Beaver Creek Valley Scale Floodplain Restoration Design Project that is facilitating floodplain correction through beaver dam analog installations. Um, and then of course we do have uh, invasive species removals in areas like the North Fork Creek watershed where invasives are being removed, native trees, shrubs, grasses, and forbs are being planted to actually create beaver habitat. It's actually called out in the application. Thank you, that's really helpful, mm -hmm. thank you. Chair Wall, this is Mark. May I make a quick comment? Yes, go ahead. Okay, just I this is a special day, folks. <laughs> $10 million, 25 projects. This is the inaugural of this private forest accord grant mitigation program. I just can't personally thank all the people that work behind the scenes on getting these applications in uh, for the review team, for the due diligence done by the agencies. Uh, this is a really cool thing and it's a really big day and I just didn't want it to go by without saying congratulations well done look forward to your next round but uh, 25 projects 10 million dollars great job thank you it is a big deal thank you go ahead commissioner um, Hatfield Hyde yeah commissioner Labbert stole my thunder there so exciting um, Kristen online and all of you I was like a, you know I don't know what is nature person in the candy store, I guess, looking through all the potential projects and just how we are taking um, conflict and turning it into projects on the ground that are going to be good for for all of us, for everyone. So it's super exciting and I am happy to make the motion um, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. So I move to approve the 25 projects recommended by funding for funding by the Private Forest Accord Grant Program Mitigation Advisory Committee as described in attachment two. I was I was a little concerned about the 37 cents there on the end of the $10 million <laughs> figure, <laughs> but, but I second that. Very exacting too, how much we're spending. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Or we can go, to, it's been moved and seconded to approve the 25 projects recommended for funding by the Private Forest Accord Grant Program. Advisory Committee, as was read into the record, and Michelle, will you um, call the roll, please? Labhart? Yes. Khalil? Yeah. King? I said we were King, but yeah. I, I, are there too many on? Here. I abstain. I have to abstain, but can you hear me? <laughs> no, somebody's got to turn off. <laughs> there we go. I abstain from the vote. Thank you. Spellbrink? Yes. Hatfield Hyde? Yes. Wall. Yes. Thanks. Thank Great. You. We are adjourned until one then, or well, we're not adjourned. We're going to take a break until one and come back for, I start with item D. So thank you all.